Welcome, everybody. Tonight, uh, we're going to cover Greek art. And at least one of the slides from tonight is definitely going to be on the midterm. And speaking of the midterm, uh, just looking ahead, as you should be able to take your, of course, that your syllabus with you, you should always have it with, obviously, each night to take, uh, you know, notes from or otherwise follow along the slide lecture. But here we go. Um, your test, welcome. Uh, your test, your midterm, you guys have a bit longer than the other classes, is going to be October 18th. So we've got a little bit of time. But uh, on the other hand, your papers are due today. And that's the first thing I want to talk about. So uh, helping you to, you know, you have, if you don't want it to be late, it needs to be in before midnight tonight. That's the, I'm giving you a little extra time in case something I add to my instructions verbally today, which I've already sent plenty of emails about and we talked about, of course, in a couple of classes, but I've also restate, uh, rewritten, I meant the, the formal, let's do this, let's do the speaker view so you can see this clearly. Okay. Um, hang on, sorry, there we go. Uh, I rewrote this. I actually already had it before, but I'm putting it on the screen again for those of you who want to um, take a screenshot or otherwise just make a mental note or even a written note of the right format. This is the title that goes in the, I call it the blue box, you know, that's the, where the attachment is in each of your uh, emails, the PDF, of course, file. And that's obviously our 2.1 short paper number one i should have crossed out the two obviously it's your first paper short paper number one underline last name first name let's get uh okay all right uh so i'll hold this up for another 30 seconds or for anybody who wants to take a screenshot or make a, a note of it somehow um this is the right format if you send it in any other way then it might not get logged in correctly and then also it needs to be sorry <laughs> to mark w at aol.com i've covered that several times i'm sure uh, many of you've already sent your papers in i i'm sure of that well i've already seen about half a dozen uh, but if though for those of you who haven't yet you have until 11 59 to be safe i wouldn't wait that long but you know a few minutes before midnight if you need it to do any minor last minute adjustments for instance, my daughter, who's taking uh, one of these same classes, she rewrote her paper three times. And that's just typical. I know people often do that, but you don't need to if you follow the five requirements. Remember that handout I gave everybody by now you all have it. And use the nine elements handout, if you haven't already, for um, you know a checklist, just to make sure that when you get to the formal analysis, that you Keep this up for a minute or so, or not even another 30 seconds, so we can get going on the rest of the lecture. But this is the format you should submit to again, markw at aol.com. Because if you send it to um, the Outlook account, it gets much more complicated and cumbersome to try and log it in. And I, I don't want to waste your time explaining why. Um, Outlook is not the most well-designed website I've ever seen. And if you want to go ahead and, and say what AOL is better, well, it is in my experience for this kind of a, a purpose, keeping track of records, uh, of student records. Okay, so there you go. That's the format you should use to send uh, your papers. If you haven't already, you cut off being midnight if you don't want five points off. Now, if somehow you you know you either send it in after midnight or you need a couple more days you only have five points off i've said this several times but i always like to repeat things because i know not everybody hears the first two or three times the late policy in this class as stated in my course and grading policies that i went over with you the first night of class is only five points off that's not even a whole grade if it's less than seven days late but if you wait for a whole week till next wednesday to turn or sorry monday i meant monday uh then it's seven it's 10 points off so seven days or more late it doesn't go up it, it just 10 points off but that is a whole letter grade you don't want to do that to yourself if you could avoid it okay are there any questions about the paper 
I mean, by now, you, I assume you've all written at least a semi-final draft, and maybe you're just going to double check it. Uh, perhaps remember citing your sources in the text. That's important. That's what a lot of people overlook or don't do uh, a thorough or correct job of doing that. And if you want to double check, I've already said this, yeah. The point is a hundred uh, paper, sorry, is a hundred points. One quarter of your total grade, the same as the midterm, the final, and the second paper, they're all equally weighted. So, you, you know, if you don't do well on one of those four assignments, you can recover with extra credit and doing better on the next few. Noodle bib, that's what I was gonna hold this up. I think you can see it now, yeah, on the screen, is a good source, or noodle tools, sorry, noodle tools. Um, yes, okay, McKenna, you have a question? Or do you? Uh, yes, yeah, please. I do. I printed out the paper that you wanted us to put as the first page so you Very can just important. easily grade it by that. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how to add it onto my Google Docs as the first I page. I've like I know how that all. is. And I've had that kind of problem with other kinds of documents that our college requires us to send back. You can send it as a separate independent file at the same time in the same email. You see what I mean? But don't forget to write your name. I'm glad you brought that up. In fact, I have a sample here, but uh, I wish I had known that. That would have made life easier. <laughs> well, it's best if you don't, because I don't know if the readers are going to be as, you know, up on this kind of glitch, whatever right. you want to call it, you know, uh, stumbling what block, I, technological what I limit uh, that we all, you know, often, I mean, at all, but often have to deal with. But if you can possibly put it all in the same file, it makes it much quicker and easier. I know a way you can do it. Yeah, I know a way you can do it. It's not too terrible. Um, sure, you do have to print your paper, but uh, there's an app for your phone called Genius Scan. Oh, now here and we have. So I just printed it, and you just pretty much take pictures, and it converts them into PDF. So I was able to put everything into one file that way. Well, I was going to say you could take a screenshot of each page. I guess one after right. the other. No, but this this is better than a screenshot because it actually oh. does convert it into a PDF. Well, then you'd have to convert your, yeah, that into a PDF. You no, it does it all. It does it for you. It does yeah. it for oh, you. Oh, okay. Say it again. What it's is like it? Genius. Genius. It's a. It's an app for your phone just called Genius. That's it. And That's it, it. But it must have a lot of different functions. So, uh, okay. It's pretty. It's pretty simple. I was impressed. Well, here's somebody saying. Uh, uh, McKenna that she didn't wasn't able to do that. I, I completely understand and sympathize. So I'm giving you the plan B backup, whatever option of just sending them both at the same time as separate PDFs. But that's if you've tried and I'm sure you guys will, you know, give it your best college try. You know that phrase? I don't know. But it's the old college try. What the heck does that mean? Anyway, in this case, it means please try first to do it however you think you can. And many people have already sent them in as a single file with the pay, uh, cover sheet uh, on the first page of the file. But if you can't, you definitely won't get marked down if you send them separately. So hopefully that helps you, McKenna, and um, a couple of other people. Uh, right. Let's see. Okay, but yeah, you see if you can follow what uh, Rob and one or two other people have been posting because they could be that there's an app <clears throat> that will work for you in your individual situation. You know, I'm constantly getting people, I don't want to waste too much time, but asking me when I, my other computer, it's, I keep calling it a mainframe. Oops, my wife corrected me. No, <laughs> that's one of those giant computers. Okay, it's my tabletop out in my studio in a separate building a distance from my house. I, you know, it's not like a long way, but it's not inside the house. So when it gets to be 10 o'clock and I've been giving two Zoom classes in a row, I don't go out there to do that. So I, I'll check my email one last time before I sign off for the night on the laptop. But guess what? All my files are out there. Why? Because all the files I store here are the huge files for the videos that I keep until the end of each semester. So if you ask me to send you an attachment or information please give me a day or two, even 48 hours from when you send the email, because I can only do it from my other tabletop in another building. And that might not be till late the next day or, or, or you know what I'm saying. But there are just these limitations built into, you know, maybe it's my laptop, so an older one, because it's got a reasonable amount of storage, I thought, but it is about eight years old. So 
what can I say? So we all have some things we have to uh, work around, uh, but I'm flexible within reason. But if you forget to send the cover page at all, I can't grade the paper because that is required to do that for me and the readers. Okay, um, I think everybody knows that the cover sheet needs to be hand printed only in one section, the top part where you put your print neatly, as neatly as you can, your full name as it was in the enrollment when you enrolled. Uh, don't use your nickname or different last name. I know a lot of people have that, but whatever you were at, name you enrolled under, the grade you blank, semester, fall 2021, and then the uh, artist's last name is, well, if you know both names, go ahead and put both, but at least the last name of the artist and the title of the work of art. That's required before we can grade it. So we can separate them out and, you know, me and the readers. And then I check every single paper that comes to me um, from, you know, uh, the readers before I enter them in the roll book uh, or the grade rosters. I always do that. And sometimes I'll add a couple of points if they overlook something. Okay, so let's see. We've got uh, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. So I sent you a, uh, a PDF with everything in it. Yeah. Including a picture of the cover sheet as the first page. But yeah. I didn't write the semester when it's due or my name. So should I completely send you a new PDF? Sorry, Just what did you, if you didn't write the semester, that's a minor detail. But if you didn't write your name, well, it's on the page below. I know, I know. I've had that question. No, it needs to be on the cover sheet because that's how I'm going to store the grades. We have to keep some record of your grades for at least six months. Okay, so how will you know which PDF is the right one? If, well, I, if I send you another one and then you have Oh, just put a tagline. I mean, a tag, uh, one sentence into your email saying, as per our you know, class discussion or tonight's you know, question, I'm resending you this with the correctly filled out cover sheet. That's it. That'll do, right? Then I'll know. I'll just delete the other one. But not until I see that you've sent the other one. So you'll get credit for turning it in on time. Try to do that before midnight tonight. And then, yeah. and then also, is there any way we could stick around after class to make sure that everything goes through? Yeah. Well, I can't check my email while my video, it takes an hour for it to download, at least on my laptop. So I won't be able to check my email until I'm like, I can wait around for questions. I always do. And I will for you and anyone, obviously. Could you, uh, could you send an email uh, saying you got it for each of us or whatever to make sure? Because I've had some problems in my other class where I sent it and the teacher didn't get it, but it says it's sent. So I'm mm -hmm. like... I don't want to be all sitting right here. Here's what we'll do. If I did it for everybody, it would take a lot longer than I've usually have time for. However, if you ask me to do that, I will. How's that? That's reasonable, isn't it? Because I'm asking. I mean, <laughs> you know, what oh, else can I say? I understand your point. It's a good one. It's Rob, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it happens occasionally. But usually it's because it was sent to the wrong or else the name on the blue box i keep calling it i don't know what else to call it the thing that has the white letters on blue background with the right title your name and i just held it up right if that isn't correct it might go astray but usually it's only if it's not correctly addressed to me at mark w at aol so if you want me to do that ask me to and i will okay thank um, you it'll probably just say got it thanks if you don't that's all i need that. that's all i need okay yeah, in your I case, I'll, I'll you probably remember, me. but go ahead and if you haven't sent the paper already, uh, ask me specifically when you do send it, okay? Yeah, Just I sent it. Be thorough, okay. All right, we should get started with tonight's lecture. And remember, uh, I, I think what we're going to do is this. It's too many slides to do in one sitting. I just gave a, an exam where it went over time and then there was half an hour of questions afterwards, but that's part of my job. Barely caught my breath, so I need a break, but I don't want us to have to go later than needed. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take maybe a slightly early break. Depends how many questions you have. Yes. Um, okay. If, if anyone has not, good question. If anyone has not been able to open the file of the cover sheet that I sent everyone at the same time, which was what, uh, a week ago or so? I can individually send it to you if you'll email me again and request it in a single sentence. You know, say I just what you just said, please resend it. Usually it goes through then, almost always. 
Okay, so go ahead and do that. Uh, maybe, you know, whenever at the break. We're going to take it. How about a 15 minute break instead of 20? Plus, we should be able to end early as it is. So if we if we take five minutes less per break, uh, my goal is to end about 9, 10, maybe 9, 15. Nobody objects, right? Take a shorter break. Is everybody okay with that? 15 minute instead of 20 minute break. Okay. Do I hear 850? 850. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, have you ever worked at an auction house? <laughs> uh, you sound like you'd be good at it. Yeah, okay, so let's go ahead and get started with the first slide. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, I do have something to show you. Hey, and I spent time drawing this, so you really wanna, okay. Here are the three, you don't have to write this, but you might find it of, of value because we're gonna use all these terms today in the meaning part of the notes for you, some of these slides. Ancient Greek art can be divided into three main periods, archaic or, you know, the early. We used to word, use the word primitive, but that's not PC anymore, so nobody says it that way. Archaic or early is from around 800 to 500 BC, I'm rounding off. Classical, where we spend the most time and is where most famous works like the Parthenon is, right, and some of the sculpture we're going to look at. That's the golden age, they called it, of ancient Greek art from about 500 to 350 BC. And then Alexander the Great's father came in and conquered the Greeks, so he was raised as a Greek. So the period from Alexander the Great, uh, well, really his father, Philip of Macedonia, and then the son, Alexander, who way outdid his father, <laughs> conquered three continents. We'll talk about him. That whole period and the successors after Alexander dies, he had still an empire, right, that was ruled by his successors. That lasted about 200 years from around 350 to 150 BC or BCE. And then of course, some of you know, as we will cover in the next two weeks after this, the Romans came in and took over everything. <laughs> so in other words, ancient classical art is, is definitely an independent you know, period of Greek history that comes after the Minoans because they were gone well long before 800 BC. And then it continues up until the Romans came and conquered Greece. And that's a long period nowhere near as long as the Egyptians, but still it's uh, it's almost a thousand years. Uh, and there's a lot of changes that occurred. That's what we're gonna talk about uh, throughout that period of uh, ancient Greek art. So let us now go to screen share. And I'm gonna start with a slide that isn't on the syllabus, but I, for, I, I didn't exactly forget to show it, but I just I wanted to end early. And I think I thought, well, we'll see if we're gonna do it. So why don't I just now enlarge this so you can see it. I'll tell you when we get to the first must know. This is a uh, Minoan fresco on the walls of a ruined villa that was at the bottom of that lake. You remember, for those of you, most of you stuck around and saw my own slides, right, of Santorini, the island. Of, it's one of the most beautiful islands I've ever seen. And if you recall, it's a crater, a volcanic crater. The right word is a caldera because it's, it's, it's uh, uh, blocked by the dried, hardened lava and filled in with uh, water from the Mediterranean. So it's become a giant like, you know, Crater Lake in Oregon, only about 50 times larger, or 30 times larger than that. And if you've ever been to Crater Lake in Oregon, it's pretty neat, but nowhere near as big as, as the one at Santorini. So that whole island was one of the most wealthy and populated parts of the Minoan culture. We covered them last week. So if you didn't see that lecture, you, you want to go back and watch it on YouTube. So here we have two teenagers boxing. They're teenage boys. And they had a rule not once blood was drawn, the match would end. You see how they, they uh, did their hair in dreads, right? And they were not supposed to be, it, there were no blood sports. In other words, the Minoans, as you said, did not abuse or mistreat animals in their religious ceremonies. The women had equal rights with men and had equal power in the political and religious uh, institutions. And they had no standing army. So here's another example of how advanced they were. They didn't believe that people should deliberately try to pummel each other into, you know, <clears throat> a very, you know, uh, bad physical shape as happened to many boxers in our modern boxing matches. Uh, they'd stop the match uh, before it got too far. If it started, it looked like someone was getting badly bloodied. But they considered it, a, a, you know, a good exercise for and, and you know for all the reflexes and muscle training and everything. So this is a three thousand five hundred year old fresco found at the bottom of that lake and then restored and uh, uh, on view if you go to Santorini in their museum. Okay, here's the first 
must know, but I'm going to use this slide. It's a new one I got recently from the slide library. It actually looks, it shows the details better. So here we go. Here's, you know, now the first one you should take notes about. Okay, it's dipilon vase. Now that is a funny word, I know. Dipilon is the first word, is two words, the title. D I P Y L O N, vase. Of course, you know how to spell vase. We don't know the author or the artist, I should say, the author, uh, artist. So we just have the location is Athens, 750 BC or BCE. This is archaic. You'd start with that. It's very early uh, of uh, mainland Greek art. There were Greek city states, remember, as far back as 500 years before this, if you recall at the end of last week's lecture when I showed you Mycenae from where the Trojan War was launched. So this is not one of the very earliest pieces of Greek art, but you start by, in your notes by just saying, this is a good example of archaic Greece, Greek vase painting. Say that fast five times. <laughs> It's a good example. You could even say, you don't say classic, that'll confuse you, you when you're reading your notes. It's a, a good example or typical, even you could say, of archaic or early Greek vase painting. They were very famous for their vase painting. But why do we say it's archaic and not classical? Well, first of all, the date tells us that it's so far back, but then the style of the, of the painting will really make that case that that's the focus of the meaning here. But first let's talk about what scenes it is. Two scenes from the Trojan War. That's what is painted onto this vase. Oh, I forgot a Dipilon vase. I better give you that as part of the meaning. What does that mean? It's about a two foot, a two to three foot tall vase with a wide opening and a narrow base with a wide opening and a narrow base and handles, a wide opening, a narrow vase and handles for carrying heavy liquids uh, or dry goods. You could, you know, put grain in it or seasoning or whatever, you know, salt, or you could put wine in it or something. It was, they were actually used. These, the, the, some vases were only decorative in ancient Greece. This one was a functional vase. So, so that's what the word dipilon means. It's exactly what you're looking at, this shape. But what is going on here with these two painted scenes? Well, they're scenes from the Trojan War. The first one is the funeral of Achilles. Now, if you don't know who he was, you'll need to write this. I'm guessing many of you already do, right? He was the greatest warrior, you could say, the uh, main hero of the Trojan Wars, for the Greeks, I should have said, the main Greek hero during the Trojan Wars. And if, again, if this isn't familiar to you, you should be writing these facts about who he was. He was a hero in that the ancient world had a different meaning of that word than we do. Well, not necessarily, <laughs> but it meant something very specific. So here, what a hero in ancient, uh, the whole ancient world, all the way from the Egyptians on through to the um, Romans, was someone who was half God and half human, half divine and half mortal. It's really no other ways to say it. I mean, they were a mixture. One parent was a god and one was a human. So they were the child of a union <laughs> between, right, uh, a god and a human being. Meaning one of the gods came down from, uh, you know, Mount Olympus, right, where they're supposed to live, down to earth and had uh, conjugal relations with a human. Literally, their offspring becomes a hero. Superhuman, in other words, in strength, and skill, superhuman. However, they were mortal. Well, he's dead, so that obviously shows he's mortal. By definition, everyone knows what the word mortal means. Right? He died from an arrow, and does anybody know what was the one part of Achilles' body that wasn't super strong and could resist? It couldn't resist, I mean. And he, yes, exactly. His heel was his only vulnerable spot. Again, that, I'm trying to keep it simple. That is, if you didn't know that, you should write it, because that's how he died. One of the Trojan warriors, I forget who now it was, shot a poison arrow from the city walls. You don't have to say from where, just say a Trojan Paris. war, shot him. Say it again. Was Paris. It? it was Paris. Paris. I thought it was. Yeah, for whom the city was named, by the way. Paris, yeah. Shot one of their great heroes in the Trojan side of the war, 
uh, figured out the weakness, Achilles heel. It's called that today. You know, people use that for, term all the time for somebody's weakness, especially in- A friend just snapped his Achilles tendon the other day. <laughs> yeah, that's somewhat related to this story. But what I want to focus on is just this scene, meaning it's after he died from a poison arrow shot into his heel, the only part of his body that could be wounded. So he died and the Greek warriors there are mourning him on his funeral pyre. And these might be his two pet dogs. I don't know, but that's what it looks like. They're dogs, definitely. And of course, they must have been in, you know, maybe with him in his tent or something when he was, you know, fighting. He, he was a hero. He won many battles. That war lasted 10 years, according to the- It looks like there's children. Say again? It looks like there's children. Uh, yeah, that could be, but I don't it, know that it's someone it, just seated it the, here. If this is a, if this is a, instead Hector, the guy that Achilles killed, then it would make a little bit more sense to me because his dogs and his wife and children were there in Troy, and they eventually did get the body back to bury it. Yeah, that's true. You know your your uh, Trojan War history, but this is the funeral of Achilles in every. It's in the Greek Museum. I've seen this, and yeah, that that is it's well identified that way by historians. However, there's so many other side potential details. I want to try and just for those who don't already know or have a special knowledge of that, to keep it to the main facts, which you need to know for in case this is on the essay part of the midterm you'd have to write about the meaning okay so i'll say it again this it depicts the funeral of achilles after he was killed by you can just say one of the trojan warriors you can say paris if you want that was that was his name uh shot in the heel by an arrow the only part of his body where he could be wounded and these are the greek soldiers mourning him now don't write this but i'm going to go ahead and do an imitation of greek funeral chants i've seen a greek um a peasant at funeral. Uh, I traveled all over Greece. I was there for weeks and weeks with a Greek family that was friends. Well, one of my teacher friends married into a Greek family. So we got me and my then girlfriend got to stay with them and travel in their little tiny car all around Greece. So we happened to wander into a village in which a funeral, don't write any of this now. I'll get back to the last part of the meaning in just a moment, what's happening in the bottom. But the last part of the upper section, which is the main event of this base, depicting the main event. These soldiers are marching around the funeral pyre. I guess it hasn't been lit yet. I don't see any flames, right? And they're chanting like this, huh! Huh! over and over. They do it for like an hour, I think, or a long time. Anyway, we, we got after about 20 minutes, we say, okay, then we get the idea. This is an old style, ancient tradition still being done in some small villages in remote parts of Greece. That's their method of, you know, instead of it with the Arabs, uh, often you'll see the ululiling. I can never say that word. I can't even do it with their tongue, right? You've seen that um, perhaps on, uh, you know, some kind of travel auger. I don't know. If you've been like I have to, to Arabic countries, you may have seen it too. That's a different kind of mourning. And of course, every culture has its own method of mourning. So just say that the soul, keep it simple, say that the soldiers are mourning the death of their hero Achilles and marching around, you could just say that, marching around his uh, funeral pyre, and that's P-Y-R-E, of course, not P-I-E-R. Okay, and then on the bottom is the battle that ensued afterwards, which would be when they sought, of course, revenge for the killing of their hero. The Greek soldiers here uh, are coming you know, toward or, or attacking, I mean, coming, attacking toward the walls of Troy. Um, and that wasn't what that finally won them. Remember, it was their subterfuge, their little trick of a Greek horse, the Trojan horse, they call it, but it was, you know, a wooden horse, but that came later. So this is just say the battle after the funeral, keep it simple, in which the Greek army, Greek soldiers, you could say it that way, are attacking Troy to get revenge for the uh, killing of their hero. Okay, that's pretty much the whole meaning, except for the fact that the style is archaic. And I said that we know it by the date, but what about the style? Well, if you can believe this, I got in trouble for saying this, but I'm sorry, I'm gonna say it again. This is pretty simplistic or naive, the artwork here. Well, let me go back up close here. Yeah. These horses 
have spaghetti legs is what my daughter used to call them when she'd see other people drawing animals like that. When she was six, she could draw horses better than this. These are supposed to be three horse heads and three horses lined up, right? Remember when we saw uh, uh, Asher and Asapal killing lions, that was actually pretty well done, except for the three horses that were lined up like this, but that was more realistic. This is not at all realistic. So if you wanna use the two words that are acceptable now for the lack of realism here, it's, you can say, simplistic or naive style. And archaic art is by definition not as realistic as later classical Greek art. For example, look at these. What are these? These are shields. Whoops, sorry, I keep doing that. Of uh, two Greek soldiers as they're attacking the city. Uh, shields, even if they have these, you know, and they do sometimes these odd shapes, that is an exaggeration or simplification of what a Greek shield would look like. They, uh, one of my other students, when they looked at this slide, said that looks like two giant half-eaten apple cores <laughs> being carried into battle. It's just a stylistic effect. And some people would say, well, maybe they did it this way just because they like these styles. The only problem with that is I think it's a lack of ability to do it better, but that's a matter of debate. You could say it that way. But I don't know of any, and I've studied Greek art quite a bit, both in Greece and even before I taught here, I took classes at Berkeley and classical art. And obviously since I started teaching, I haven't seen any examples of early archaic art from this far back that were much more realistic than this. Classical art, absolutely. You'll see the difference in a few, a couple more slides. Okay, so just say that there's some debate or discussion, disagreement, whatever word you want to use, about whether or not these, the, the, this artist, sorry, this painter, obviously it's the painter that did this, could have done a better job or chose just to be more simplistic or naive. But, the evidence is overwhelming that it's just it's what they knew how to do because that period in history you just don't see much more realism in their painting this far back you you did in the minoan culture and of course with the egyptians and the babylonians okay so it could be just the artist just was deliberately doing a less realistic style but there's a debate on that all right someone had a question i'm sorry i was focused on on trying to get yeah let's see it. Well, when you started to say like simplistic and stuff, that should we be including that more in the beginning of the formal analysis? <laughs> Both. It's a good when question. You call it simplistic, no, it's a good question. You... And I would say that's what happens with art history. In some pieces and slides you're going to see have already happened once or twice. The style is part of the meaning. But if the style is related to the elements of composition, then it comes under both headings. You see what I mean? Okay. So it's a good point. Yeah, you're, you're definitely raising a good question. Let's see. This semester is fall 2021. Yeah, I almost wrote fall 2020 on uh, a sample paper I was showing my class last week, at my in-person class. Um, yeah, we already covered that. Okay, so let's now do the formal analysis. This is balanced left to right but unbalanced toward the top because of the shape of the vase, obviously, right? So you're looking at the vase overall for that. But when it comes to space, you're gonna look at each of the two painted scenes. And there's only one technique for space here and it should be obvious it's overlapping and it's minimal at that. I don't see much overlapping except the shields more so down in the, the lower scene, right? The horses very minimally overlapping in their string legs or spaghetti legs overlap in their heads, right? So there is some overlapping, mostly on the bottom scene. I guess you could say there's maybe a hint. Now, they don't even see it here in the funeral pyre, right? When you look at this, you start to see the figures are all pretty separate, separated. So it's really only overlapping on the bottom scene and no uh, spa space techniques at all on the upper scene. By the way, this is not register line. I can understand why some people have thought that. And, and if this was on the midterm in the past, I've had people write that and get a couple of points off because it's not. There's two different scenes that occurred a couple of weeks apart. If I recall my history, I know it was a while later. They mourned for a long time in ancient Greece, especially with their main hero just died. The, the mourning, um, ceremony went on for a long time so this battle scene is, is later at a later time you know days or a couple of weeks later so it's not two scenes happening simultaneously one closer than the other so there's not register line here Just make sure you write that here we have some um uh modeling yes and no I, I, it's probably fading from the 
uh, you know, aged of uh, the condition of this face. It was found in pieces, cracked. You can probably see that it had to be repaired if you look closely, right? But but all the pieces were there. Uh, this isn't a reproduction. Okay, Rob, what what did you want to know? Go ahead. Uh, I, I just have another question. Sure. I mean, I know this is pottery, but would this be considered a fresco as well? Uh, that is a, a good question no one's ever asked before. I wouldn't say so because it's not on wet plaster. That's the official definition. Because it, the medium's different? Yes, it is different. Yeah, it's it's paint on a uh, hard ceramic. So no, it's not a fresco. Uh, okay, the colors are warm or neutral and warm because look, the, the shields tell us it was probably solid black and so was Achilles' body and it's just faded. That's what most people, well, most historians believe. So assuming all the, all the human figures and the horses and the shields were black, that's neutral. The, everything else is warm. Obviously, it's a kind of a burnt orange color, isn't it? It's very, uh, I like that color a lot. And that's clearly a warm color. So it's a warm background, neutral uh, objects or figures in, in both halves. There's the rhythm of the bodies, of course, uh, including the ones with their hands raised above their heads as they go <laughs> like that. I can't even do it. <laughs> it clears all the, all the uh, cheese out of your throat if you do that often enough. <laughs> And then we have, which is the largest mass? Well, that's hard to say. You know, is this one mass, the whole thing? Because it looks like to, almost like an under section supporting the, you know, maybe the two legs. That, that almost could be, if that's the case, then you might think, oh, well, that's diminishing size. These legs are further away than those. But there's no way to know that. So just assuming that it's two separate objects, one, you know, uh, beside the other. All we can say is maybe Achilles' body, but look at the mourners. So I think they're almost the same size. So just say the Achilles and the mourners' bodies, the soldiers mourning, are roughly the same size. They'd be the largest mass on the upper piece. And then it would probably be, uh, you know, these, these figures down here. I think we said they're either children or maybe, I don't think his wife was there. I don't remember that. Anybody seen the movie Troy, by the way, with, uh, of all things, Brad Pitt, well, he plays before Achilles. The war began. Not a bad movie. Not, uh, pretty they, accurate to the, the Greek legend. It's called Troy. And you could watch before that. Before the war began. Yeah. Uh, All right, go ahead. Go ahead. I didn't actually hear killed his whole family. Achilles kills his whole family like in a fit of rage induced by now. the gods. I forgot. And that. so they're able to blackmail him because mm -hmm. either you're going to be put to justice in your homeland or you're going to fight for the king in Troy. Okay, well, yeah. I guess I'll fight for That's Troy. how they got him to do his duty. Yeah, good point. Well, you don't have to write that, you guys. It's that's, uh, but it's interesting information. In any case, you decide what the second largest masses are up there. I, I'll leave that to you. I'd say it's the pyre because these are thick you know, posts or whatever they are. And then maybe this woman, I assume it's a woman, I can't tell for sure on the side here, or maybe it's just uh, someone can about to light the match for the, or not matches, the fire I'm in. Down here, it's probably the horses and then the shields. And then this one charioteer here, I don't know any other word for the guy, I guess. All right, let's see, are we covering? Oh, no, there's no cement texture, none and no modeling. Not really. I started to say that before, but I didn't finish that thought. I mean, there isn't any. It, it's all solid. These originally were silhouette figures, all of them. So the human and animal figures uh, and the objects. So there's no modeling and no simulated textures here. It's dynamic uh, in that the shape of the vase itself is and these shields. But the human figures are almost entirely stable. They're all upright or Achilles, of course, is horizontal. <laughs> So I'd say it's more stable, both scenes, than dynamic. But down down below, it's maybe more half and half because of the three shields and the horses' heads here. All right. Um, I think we covered everything. Rhythm, of course, the repeated arms, hands, legs, and so forth. I think that's it. Love. Balance, balance. Yes, this is, I already said that. Yeah. Each scene is balanced, too, roughly, roughly, right? depending on where you draw the line. Certainly this scene is, and the overall piece itself, left to right, but it's unbalanced toward the top. Okay, we got to pick up the pace here or we'll never get done. So um, this is- I have a quick question. Very quick, yeah, because we're waiting. Um, I don't think you touched on line for the last one. I think, I thought I did. Yeah, uh, thank you though. If I didn't, um, didn't realize that. I, I don't see line here except, oh, whoops, whoops. Yes, there's line, of course. Yes, I did forget you right now that I think about it. Because in my mind, I was thinking there is no line. I didn't say that. On the human figures and the animals, there's no line. They're just silhouettes. But yes, there is line 
as a decorative border around each scene. That's how you'd write it. And those are bold lines. I would call them bold lines. So bold lines uses decorative patterns, but the scenes, each of the two scenes themselves don't have line because it's all silhouettes. At least originally we think they were all solid. Okay, good point. All right, let's move on to the next must know. Now this one, I'm gonna tell you up front is so important. I won't cut it from the study list. Remember, I always try to do that each time one of those slides comes up. And this is Dionysus in a boat. The title Dionysus, and that's D-I-O-N-Y-S-U-S. -S, Dionysus in a boat. Now we start to know the names of some of the artists. In this one, we do know who, who painted it, Ezekias. And it's, of course, it's his last name. And it's spelled E-X-E-K-I-A-S. E-X-E-K-I-A-S, 540 BC or BCE. This is early classical. Now, if you've been, uh, you know, asking yourself, well, where are the cutoffs? Or you saw, I think everyone's here when I held up that piece of paper about the cutoffs for each period. Well, you might think, wait a minute, didn't, didn't I just say that 500, not 540 BC was the beginning of classical? Yes, but like every other period of human history in every culture, some artists are ahead of their times, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't advance, would we? We wouldn't get new techniques and better style, you know, stylistically more realistic or more, you know, evocative, more interesting art. Uh, each culture has had, if it lasted more than a few generations, any culture lasts several centuries, let alone more than that, is going to go through transitions where there's some artist ahead of all the others. This guy was one of those. So just how you start the notes is first to say, Ezekias was considered the first great classical painter. His vase painting was realistic and therefore cla early classical style. It was realistic, or you could say more realistic, no, much more actually, much more realistic than the earlier archaic paintings. And therefore it qualifies him as an early classical painter. This is one of his earliest works. Uh, yes, please, Devin. Do you know how um, the knowledge of who created each piece is preserved since there's yeah, no- Yeah, that's a good question. I only know the, the, the sort of the generic answer to that in each individual case, you'd have to do the research to know. But um, the scholars who have recorded uh, from ancient Greek and Roman documents, which do exist, you know, right, that are in uh, libraries and museums and things in those, usually in the country where they, the works come from, have done some research and they've been able to verify that Ezekiel had a workshop ahead of his time because he and his, his assistants, he taught them, of course, were able to come up with these, you know, more realistic techniques, and that he painted this scene, and this was one of his most popular. You could guess that if he just painted one every few weeks, he, he'd starve, you know, I mean, how much could you be paid for one vase? So he had a workshop with dozens of, of assistants, and so there's records from that workshop, you know, I, I, I'm not sure if it's in the National Archives in Athens, but anyway, it's somewhere in Greece. Yeah, so there are records that name him and that describe his pieces in, of course, ancient Greek, and it's termed and translated, but it's a good question. Okay, so this piece we do know is one of uh, Ezekiel's first pieces and one of the earliest, if not the oldest, certainly that you're gonna see in this class, examples of classical style painting. What makes it more realistic? Well, everything. But we'll get to that, <laughs> sort of riffing off what I guess was Rob said earlier how sometimes things overlap from where the style of the work of art is part of the meaning, but it also overlaps in the formal analysis. So let's, on the notes for the meaning, I already told you who Ezekiel was, you should have that now in your notes. The second fact is what's a scene depicting? Oh boy, is this a complex work of art. So I'm gonna to cut to the minimum, but it's gonna take a little longer to explain because there are two, now you should you know, write this is the next part of your notes on the meaning, two, origin myths being depicted on this face. Two, ancient Greek, of course, origin myths. There's no other way to say it. 
In other words, every culture has an origin myth. We have our silly stuff about, I don't know anybody talks about it anymore, but we used to be told George Washington couldn't tell a lie. Yeah, right. And he didn't cut down the cherry tree. He told his father, you know, every culture has some kind of myth about how they got started or some part of their culture. So I'll say it again. This depicts two of the ancient Greek origin myths, the origin of dolphins and wine. Huh? You might say, well, here's how that works. First of all, the story it depicts is a scene from the Greek gods, Dionysus. I bet some of you know he was the god of what? That wine. Of, yeah, wine. Okay. So, well, among other things, well, that's he's, what he's famous for. Fertility. So, he came down to earth disguised as a human. That gods always would do that. And that meant he became a normal uh, human sized, you know, figure or, you know, person and he was kidnapped by pirates and while he was on that pirate boat he warned those pirates who he was he said if you don't let me go i will become my full size which is if you don't know about greek myths they're always 50 feet tall male and female gods and goddesses they were always the full gods the main ones were 50 feet tall so he told them if you don't do that let me go I am the god Dionysus. Of course, they just laughed at him. Uh, you're going to be sorry because I'm going to become my full size. So since they didn't let him go, he turned into a 50 foot tall, you know, figure. And that forced all the pirates into the water where here's here's the catch. They would have drowned, but he took pity on them and turned them into dolphins. So did you ever guess dolphins were descended from pirates from ancient Greeks? Well, that's what the Greeks told themselves, their kids at least. I don't know if they believed it, but that's the myth of the origin of dolphins the Greeks used to tell. Once again, that he became his full size, thereby forcing the pirates into the water where they were started to drown, and he turned them into dolphins so they wouldn't drown, taking pity on them. How about the origin of wine? Well, he was thirsty. You know, it's hot. There's no shade. You're out in the middle of whatever, the Mediterranean. You just say he was out in the middle of the, the sea with, you know, no shade. So he was thirsty. So he turned the mast into a bunch of grape vines. You see that? The mast. And then the grapes fermented in the hot sun and voila, you have wine. Don't ask me how long that would have taken, but anyway, that's their story about the origin of wine and how he became the god of wine or the inventor of it, you could say, creator of wine. So those are the two Greek origin myths that are depicted here. Now, last part of the meaning is how is it a, a, a more realistic scene? Uh, and therefore, stylistically, of course, it's the, um, I've already said, of course, a er, early example of classical art. Well, let's start with simulated texture. You could just say that now you should shift to, you know, the second category if you're using the headings. We're going to do the formal analysis, which will explain how much more realistic and, and why we say that about it. Let's start with um, the simulated texture. I see a lot of it. It's definitely there on the grapevines or the bunches, I should say, the bunches. I even sense it on the sail. I can almost feel the, you know, the cloth sail against the wind, I mean, uh, billowing the sail. And definitely it's on his star-shaped pajamas. That's, now I don't know any other explanation. That's his legs stretching out across the boat because he's 50 feet tall now. He's obviously, you know, uh, stripped to the waist, but he's either it's a blanket or it's pajama bottoms, you decide, that have stars on them. Well, that gives you some kind of a hint of some kind of fabric or, uh, you know, a simulated texture, but definitely you see it on his head, his beard, and his, he has a crown on actually here, now, which is unusual for God, but some of them did. Uh, so I guess a lot of them did, yeah. So he has, you know, on his head, he has cement texture on his, his beard and his crown. There's, I would even hint on the bow. I mean, hint, I, I would say in your notes, I think that looks like carved wood. It's a wooden boat, of course, it would have to be. Uh, and then there's, you know, this almost dolphin-like face. And that, you can say it's minimal, but there is some texture on, again, several parts of this painting. On the grape bunches, on his, you could just say his head if you want to. Uh, I would say on the covering blanket, or whatever it is on his legs, and definitely on, on the front part of the boat. Not so much on the dolphins, right? Or the bottom of the boat. 
All right, then we have no modeling. No, that, that's something they still didn't really do much of this far back. Uh, the rhythm should be obvious. The dolphins are almost all the same shapes as are the, the grape uh, bunches. Uh, and then, of course, you have uh, the car patterns on the boat and the lines. That's all done with painted line. The boat itself is supposed to imply car, but that's actually obviously on the face itself that's painted. Uh, and then we have uh, the, um, so I see bold lines here, mostly bold lines around the dolphins. And I would say most of the boat, maybe some thin lines on his body, I guess, and his head. Okay, um, and then we have the rhythm, of course, of the railing on the boat, the, the grape bunches, and the vines, of course, and, and the dolphins. It's dynamic. The only thing stable is the mast itself before it branches out into grape vines. Um, and so that's about it. Every other line is curved, so it's almost entirely dynamic. It's roughly balanced with, uh, you know, the mast across the middle of the boat, roughly equal on either side. And certainly the number of dolphins is pretty close to equal. So I just call it roughly balanced. Uh, it's true there are four great, you know, bunches here, but then, you know, here's a dolphin. So you decide, but if you look at it overall, it has a roughly balanced feel left to right. And I would say certainly top to bottom, if you draw the line across the uh, bottom of the sail, <clears throat> it's warm colors on everything, right? The orange background and the dark brown objects, except for the sail, of course, and that's cool. Um, and then we have for space, just overlapping. I don't see any foreshortening or any other technique. You know, he overlaps or the railings overlap him. He overlaps the sail a little bit. And of course, um, uh, you could say, well, actually that's about it. There isn't a lot of overlapping, but there is some mostly on the boat. Okay. Um, dynamic, I'm forgetting anything. Color modeling, I think. We, oh, I forgot to say what this is. It's a shallow bowl shaped. Sorry, this could go. You don't have to add another line to meaning you have plenty, but if you want to, the shape is, of this kind of base is not at all the same as the other one. It should be obvious. This is a very shallow. We're looking down into bowl shaped uh, a vase uh, with two handles in which uh, dry goods were kept. You wouldn't carry liquid in this, it wouldn't work. So it would be things like, you know, fruit, right? And, uh, you know, bread and things, you know, to put on your table. So dry goods, mostly uh, items to eat were, were carried in these, it's called a calyx. If you want to know the word, it's a K-A-L-I-X. You can just say shallow bowl-like shape is uh, the style of base here. So, okay, moving on. We're doing better on time now. So we still should be able to see. This is another uh, version of it at the Athens Museum. And this is a, a good quality copy, but it's not the uh, one of the original pieces. This one is, you can see that it, it's had to be restored. It's not too hard to tell the difference when you you know look closely at these kind of details. See, this is just too perfect, right? Or it's a good imitation because they even kind of hint at the breakage, but this has clearly been repainted. Nicely done, actually. But uh, uh, if it's on the exam, I will show this. I mean, all the elements I just gave you are the same between these two. Uh, but this one is more accurate and the colors are more uh, correct. Okay. Now, this is not a must know. I just wanted you to see this is another. There are three shapes of Greek vases for what that's worth. And this is another Ezekias. And this one is closer to the beginning, like 510 BC. And it's a scene during the Trojan War in which Ajax and Achilles we're playing checkers. Yes, they had checkers then. Chess came a little later, I think. Pretty sure. Uh, but checkers or some similar game existed. Board games were around all the way back to ancient Egypt, of course. Um, <clears throat> so they're playing, you to say, a board game is what the museum called. I've seen this piece. Again, it's in the Athens Museum. It's a wonderful museum. Uh, the biggest art uh, museum of artifacts of all ancient Greek styles and periods is in Athens. Um, so it's look how realistic the cement texture is here. You have to write this. It's not on the syllabus. Look at the detailing here. He sees getting more skilled as, as uh, the decades move on. By this time, his work was being exported outside of Greece too, I think. I'm pretty sure you have to write that. But, but his work was known not just in Greece, but almost certainly in Asia Minor, right? Which is Turkey today, we call it. 
and further up into the Balkans, you know, their neighbors to the north that later conquered them, right, where Alexander the Great's father came from. So his stuff was so well liked that uh, copies of it were made by his workshop and probably also, you know, fake copies made, you know what I mean, by hucksters and sold all over the uh, Mediterranean. Yeah, he became the most successful of all the answers we have. So now we get to an important piece that is the next must know. Uh, and this won't be quite as, as long, uh, the notes on this one. Koros, K, just one word is the title. K-O-U-R-O-S. K-O-U-R-O-S. Athens, a location we don't know the artist. The date is 525 BC. Now we get to the first definition for tonight. It's on your, it's on your list. Koros, right? I already spelled the word, so, but here's the definition. It's about halfway down the second page of, ter of your list of terms to know. Okay, so it's, it's not a very short definition. So I'll say it slowly and repeat it once. Koros was a Koros, it's a type of sculpture, was a life-size statue of an adult male figure from ancient Greece. Sorry, it is a long definition, but I'll repeat it. Uh, again, the first part, it's a life-size statue uh, of an uh, ancient Greek male, or you say a male from ancient Greece, either way, comma. Okay. Which depicted a victor in athletic or military contest, which depicted, you could say someone who was a, but that's, you don't need to write that much. So just depicted a victor, you know, someone who was victorious in uh, a contest, usually a athletic or military contest. I'll say it again, which depicts someone who is victorious in some kind of contest, usually military or athletic. Sorry, not done yet, comma and often placed over that person's grave after they died, and often placed over that person's grave after they died. I'm giving you a heads up here. It's a word to the wise. Don't make the mistake of calling this a gravestone or grave marker. It's just after they died, some families you know, might choose to move the statue from wherever it had been in their house, right, or their garden onto the grave, but it's just uh, sometimes. So I'll say it all again, I'll repeat the whole definition. A Koros was a life-size statue of an ancient Greek male, comma, a victor in a contest, usually military or athletic, comma, and often, well, I'd say sometimes is better to be safe, and sometimes placed over that person's grave after they die, period. So it was done when they were young and healthy. That's the whole point. This statue has two other important details that mark it as uh, an important example of archaic Greek sculpture. It's late archaic. It's getting close to the beginning of the classical times, right? You can tell by the year if you were following, you know, that chart I held up to the screen. So this is very late archaic, but it is archaic for two reasons. The stiff formal pose. Yeah, but look how he's standing. That's not natural. The stiff formal pose is one feature of all archaic sculpture in ancient Greece. And the other, and I'll go up close now for this, is the frozen smile. I mean, the face doesn't have any emotion to it. It's not realistic. And even look at the eyes. They don't even look like human eyes. So it has a frozen smile, or you can say an archaic smile. That's the word that historians use. But what that means is it, it, no real emotion is shown. Therefore, again, that's not realistic. Of course, human beings, no matter what they're thinking, have some emotion that you can see in their face. That's not, unless they're sleeping, right? So Did at this the, point... Like the hair like... Yeah. Was that, Sorry? Was that, like, was that a common hair? Here's oh yeah yeah very common yeah the greeks well i it's a good question yeah because I, I i started i don't know i think you might have been here when we started with the first slide but it was just my own slide of uh, two boys boxing in uh on santorini that was found in the ruins of the minoans so the minoans did this you know they right they 
uh, either braided their hair or had dreads. In this case, it's braided. I would call it braided. Yeah, the Greeks uh, often did that with the, the hair of male sculpture. And that's that's because they did it in real life, too. Yeah, it's not just a, a decorative feature. The two things together, the stiff formal pose and the archaic or frozen, you could use either phrase, smile on the face with no real emotion are features that mark this as archaic style. People don't usually stand like this. I mean, that's very unusual, to, but it wasn't meant to be realistic that way. However, the other part of it, the last thing about the meaning that is important is nonetheless, or you could say regardless of its stiff formal pose and the archaic style of it, it does depict the anatomy very accurately. Look at the details of the muscles, right? On the chest, uh, even the thumbnails and you know hands and the uh, toes and uh, except for the face, the hair. So the details are anatomically correct, you could say that, or accurate. And why? Because when a sculpture depicts a perfect physique, whether male or female, especially for an adult figure, any Greek sculpture that depicts a perfect physique, what they, the Greeks considered perfect would be this kind of male figure or female figure. So it applies to both male and female sculpture. Whenever they depict what they thought of as a perfect physique in their sculpture, they were saying they believe this person was uh, favored by the gods, plural, favored by their gods, you know, the ancient Greek gods with that, you know, gift of perfect physique or health, or whatever, you know, stamina, strength, all things that supposedly go together with a healthy body, quote unquote. At that time, of course, they they had already, the Olympics were happening. So of course they were very into, uh, you know, uh, physical um, health and, and uh, stamina and, and uh, strength. So I'll say that again, that the uh, physique here on this uh, sculpture is typical of the Greeks belief Throughout all there are, not just archaic, in fact, if anything, it got even more noticeable in the next slide, you'll see it, with classical, you just say all ancient Greek sculpture, when it depicted, and rarely did they have any that weren't, a perfect physique, male or female, it was uh, a, a way of saying that the gods favored that person. So in other words, this person, whoever it was that modeled for this, this Koros, was probably, you know, the son of a wealthy, of course, you'd have to have money to afford to have a piece of sculpture made of your son, right? Or, or probably the father paid for it when he had won some kind of contest, maybe in the Olympics, maybe a local village contest, you know, athletic contest, or maybe a, a battle in, in war. And then the family pays to have the sculpture to honor that person. And so, of course, they're thinking the gods honored my son, so I'm going to honor him my own way with the sculpture. Okay, let's do the formal analysis. It is, it's an intact human body, so of course it's going to be totally balanced, left to right and top to bottom. The rhythm, again, is obvious because you see the two hands, the two feet, not really much of the eyes, but they're there, you know, the bulging eyes and, of course, the hair and the muscles that creates a lot of rhythm. It is almost entirely stable. Really, the only thing dynamic is the top of his head and a little bit on the upper hips, you could say, but look at these arms and the legs are, you know, almost directly his head and neck straight up, it's mostly stable. I, I don't think you can break it down into masses. The base is not old, that's that's a museum piece there. So it's really a single mass. For space, there's no techniques for space in this piece because it's a single uh, human figure. So it's just a real space of about a six foot tall uh, body, a man's body, about six feet tall. I mean, you could say the hair overlaps the forehead if you really want to stretch it but that's part of the uh, appearance of this original person there modeling here modeling is speaking of which is is only in the lighting from the museum of course there's no technique for modeling there is carved line though even though it's not very realistic there's not much emotion there is still uh, the details are accurate the ears the lips the nose the hair and the muscles so there's a lot of carved line uh and then let's see um Balance, mass, stable. Oh, texture. The texture here is both a smooth texture of marble. Most Greek sculpture was marble and color, right? I won't forget color. And then we have the semi texture of the hair and to a, some degree, at least on the fingernails and, and toenails, I would say you see realistic cement texture. But the rest of the body is pretty much 
mostly what you see is the real smooth marble texture. So it has both real and similar texture. The color was originally a cool gray and that we know because this is what it originally looked like, but it's been discolored from centuries of being buried in the ground. This was found buried. I don't know where, but somewhere in Greece. Okay, let's do one more and then we'll take a slightly early break. But this next one is probably the most important, one of the two, sorry, most important slides you're going to see uh, today. Well, let's do the core. I, I, I sometimes skip it, but I actually want to show you. This is not a must know. The next one is a very important one. So then we'll take a break after the slide after this. This is the female version of a coros, a core. Again, don't need to know this for the exam. But look at what's happened with that archaic smile. I call it the Prozac just kicked in. Look at her face. Look at her eye. Now, here you see more detail, but it, it's, it's not at all. All of these sculptures had the exact same expression is my point. They weren't meant to indicate individual features, let alone emotions. So this archaic smile in a female statue might look a little bit more lively, but it's the same concept. She's standing stiff and upright, not realistically. And if you're curious, the colors, the henna, they call that right on, that's really, we know now Greek sculpture was mostly painted, not white. Everyone thinks, or I used to, that Greek sculpture, because that's all you see anymore, what's left over is, is unpainted, right? Just the white marble. Actually, originally most sculptures, not all, but most Greek sculpture was painted. There's even a little bit of it left on her dress. You see that here. And yes, she had a, her forearm was sticking out of that's missing obviously here. Um, and then you see some of the, a little bit of the color around her uh, eyes and, and lips. She's four foot um, 10. And that was a common height for women in ancient Greece, if you can believe that. There's been obviously an increase in the height of adult male and female human beings all around the world over the last 2,500 years. Okay, but that's not a must know, but this one definitely is. Very important slide. We'll definitely not cut it. has a very high possibility of being on the midterm. Okay. Would, so the, uh, Sorry. Greek soul, would the Greek soul or spirit be in the statue after their death? That's a good question that I should maybe have read something about, but I haven't enough recently anyway that I can remember to answer. So you could check on that and if you want to, uh, I don't know, there must be in the museum in Athens, there might be something about that on their website. I'm not certain. I don't think so. I don't think so. I've never, that I can recall, I've never read that that's the case that the, the spirit of the person was captured in the, in the uh, uh, sculpture. I don't believe so, but the personality of the person wasn't even attempted in archaic sculpture. There was no effort to do that. However, well, sorry, I well, can't. That would, be why that would be why they're represented in like a uh, physically youthful and a uh, placid, placid. Well, demeanor. that was their religious. I actually, that's a good thing you brought that up. I should have added that that was a religious belief. So it didn't have to do with the individuals they were depicting. It had to do with their overall arching belief that God favored the gods, sorry, the gods, remember multiple gods, favored certain people down on earth. And that's why some of them were meant to become heroes or leaders, or rulers, whatever. Uh, so I don't think it's quite the same thing. I understand your question, but as far as I know, that that wasn't the case. Um, there may be some well, evidence. You, you know, if they if their ancestor did live on forever because of the statue, and then they made the statue looking angry, that would not. <laughs> that yeah. could be bad to have an angry ancestor looming over you the whole time. But having okay. them with a smile on their face yeah. makes them eternally happy. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a lack of ability or choice, we don't know which, to depict more realism. But I can tell you the pose, no question they didn't know how to depict a more realistic pose. So let's now segue. This one is really important. So let's talk about the meaning. This is spear bearer. Okay, two words, just like it sounds. Spear bearer, polyclitos, P-O-L-Y-K-L-E-I-T-O-S, 450 B.C. or B.C.E. So here we have a classical statue or piece of sculpture, obviously it's a statue of an adult man by the first great classical sculptor. That's really an important fact. Polyclitos is considered the first, you could say famous because we know there could have been some before him that have been lost in the records of time. But 
far as we know, anyway, just say the first famous or known, uh, really successful or famous uh, Greek classical sculptor. And he is sometimes, just say some historians, it's always safe to say it that way, some historians credit him with inventing this pose. And that's the bulk of the, well, the most important part of the meaning is this radical new pose that no other culture had come up with. It was the Greeks that invented it. And so it's a long definition. There's no way to make it shorter than several lines, but you need to know this because it could easily come up on both the slide section, right? of the uh, midterm and on the true false section. Uh, so you want to make sure you have this in your notes. I'll say it slowly and repeat it. The next definition on your list of terms to know, contrapposto, C-O-N-T-R-A-P-P-O-S-T-O. Contrapposto. So contra, C-O-N-T-R-A, double P-O-S-T-O. Contrapposto is a pose for sculpture invented by the ancient Greeks with three features. Do you see why it's not a short definition? It's a pose for sculpture invented by the ancient Greeks with three features. Okay. First, um, <clears throat> we have the weight is on the back leg and the front leg is loose. This leg is in front of that leg look carefully. If you go around the side, it'd be even ob more obvious, but you just write it for now. Let's just keep it simple. So you'll have the definition of, as it uh, will come up. It might very likely will come up on the midterm. Again, I'll say the first feature is that the uh, back, the weight is on the back leg and the front leg is loose. Don't write right or left nothing to do with that. It's again, only because the back leg is carrying the weight. This is how people really stand in real life. It's a radical new breakthrough from archaic style sculpture. Okay, so you see the weights on this leg, the back leg, the front leg is loose. Second, one arm is down, you see it there. The other is raised, usually holding something. That's it, the second feature, pretty self-evident. One arm is down and the other is raised, usually holding something. Well, he's carrying what would be a spear, but that's a modern, uh, the, the original spear is probably missing a long time ago. It should be obvious it was found in pieces and it cemented together. If that's not obvious, you can write that. But let's finish the definition here. And then finally, the third feature of contrapasso is the spine forms a gentle S curve. The spine, if you were to look at it, forms a gentle S curve. That is how human beings really stand when they're at ease or relaxed. It's the most realistic, uh, nobody's done more realistic style of posing for sculpture ever since. It's, it's a breakthrough. This is a seminal work of art, no question. Now, of course, this is a Roman copy of the original, which disappeared a long time ago. You could add that if you want to uh, in your notes about the meaning. And that's indicated by the fact that these lines here are concrete or cement, I guess it's cement, not concrete, cement used to, uh, you know, stick the pieces together after it was found in, in ruins. Okay, and it was missing the spear, so that the museum added this spear. Okay, so he was probably an athletic victor, but he could have been a military victor, but this is not a Koros. This is not a Koros. Uh, because this is an actual portrait of a real person that posed for this, and that wasn't necessarily even the victor of anything. It's more of an indication of a style. What matters, in other words, about the meaning in the notes that you should now all have is that this is the first, I'll say this and repeat it, very important fact and most important fact about the meaning that it is the first famous piece of sculpture that used contrapposto pose. That pose I just defined for you. So, of course, he is often credited, I already said this, by many historians with having invented it. We can't prove that. There aren't any records. That, you know, they didn't have patents and copyrights and, you know, intellectual lawsuits and stuff like we do today to prove who did what first. Uh, so we don't know for sure, but it is the first famous piece of sculpture by the first famous classical sculptor to use the contrapposto uh, pose. So that marks it as a seminal work of art. The Romans copied it 
many times throughout the Roman Empire, there were copies of this very piece and many others by uh, Polycletos, the same sculptor. Okay, and then we have the fig leaf. Some of you may have guessed. You could add this if you want. You don't have to. You have enough about the meaning now. Oh, the perfect physique. That leads to the other point that someone was raising just before we switched slides. Here, there's a motion in the face, and the physique is, is in a way similar in the, to the archaic piece we just saw, the curls, right? But it's still the same overall concept of the perfect physique, whether it was an archaic piece like the Koros or this one by uh, Polycletos, a perfect physique is a religious concept to the ancient Greeks. They believed their religion taught them that gods favored certain people, and those are the ones that you would depict with perfect physique. So if this was a portrait, we don't know. We don't have any records of this to know. Was it a portrait of an actual victor, an athletic or a military victor? If so, then it could have been, it might have been a, uh, a corals. But in this case, what matters, you can ignore that fact if it's on the exam and focus on the pose and how original and advanced and realistic it was, as well as the perfect physique symbolizing the gods favoring this person. And then you see realistic looking emotion. It looks to me like a guy's getting ready to pitch a javelin in an athletic contest, probably some kind of an Olympic or maybe local you know, contest of athletes. Uh, but we don't know that. Could have been someone who had won a battle. Um, but it, in any case, what matters more than you know what he might have achieved is his physique and his pose and who Ezekiel, uh, sorry, who Polycletos the sculptor was. Okay, any questions? Because this is really important. We'll wrap it up and take our break in about, see, we're taking a break early. So we're going to be able to end at least, uh, I would say, close to 15 minutes early, somewhere in that range maybe depending on how many questions you have. We still have the two more slides after the break that are really important. And one in particular that has a high probability of being on the midterm. Okay, let's do the formal analysis. This looks warm, I know. In fact, now it is. So if you wanna write it that way, the bottom half is warm and the upper half is cool, but it originally all was a cool gray color, the whole piece. Because uh, you know that's the kind of marble that it was used uh, to create it. And we have carved line, of course, on the face, on the hair, uh, on the muscles, right? Hands and feet. The rhythm, it's a human body. So of course it's got two hands, two arms, two legs, uh, two eyes, uh, plenty of rhythm. It is both dynamic and stable. That S curve effect, you know, of the pose of contrapposto creates a slightly dynamic line to the overall pose, doesn't it? Uh, but you could make the case that, you know, one arm, this arm being down is mostly stable and the upper legs, at least the upper part of his legs are, uh, but then his head's turned, you know, that's just a choice the sculptor made uh, in many contrapposto pieces, the head is facing forward. That isn't what marks it as classical. That's a choice of the uh, particular sculptor. So you could just say it's a mixture, really. Obviously, the top of his head is dynamic, but is uh, at least is uh, lowered arm and upper legs are stable it's you could break it down into three masses his figure and here the base or the tree actually that's part of the original piece um the uh, tree stump if you want to call it that's what it is yeah would be the second largest mass and then it's either the base would be third or the spear uh, if the spear was intact it would be much longer of course but the way it looks now it's probably just first the, the his figure his body then the tree stump and third would be the base uh let's see now uh, see me a texture and real of course sculpture it's always by definition both the real smooth texture of marble shows through but the see texture especially on his head uh his face and his hair and that's not original that was added by a pope or some other catholic church official many centuries later probably 17 or 1800s you know uh, it's a, they, the Greeks wouldn't have worried about that. That wouldn't have been part of their, you know, stylistic concerns. Uh, so you don't want to describe that as part of the original simulated texture. But there is on the, it's hard to see, but you, well, you can see it here on his fingers, right? So there's good carved line to create simulated texture. The modeling is, of course, not a technique. It is the result of the museum lighting. Uh, and then we have, uh, let's see, um, modeling colored, oh, space. It's a life-size human figure. It's about six feet tall. And there is overlapping, obviously. His hand overlaps the spear. 
and um, I, it's like does slightly well it's hard to see because I, I haven't seen this statue I haven't been in Greece in a long time it's many decades ago uh, it doesn't look like it overlaps to me here so you can see his feet overlap the base I guess and, and one hand overlaps the spear but otherwise it's a real space about a six foot tall piece of sculpture uh, and then we have let's see are we forgetting anything modeling texture space dynamic right oh balanced is it balanced yeah i would say so uh again it's a human body and it's intact it just depends on where you draw the line but the base might weight it down more toward the bottom i know for some people that would be a, a given right uh and then when you add this tree stump i guess you could make the case that no matter where on his body you draw the line roughly either the waist or just below it there's more mass below but then the upper part of his body is more solid than the two legs which are apart so you decide but technically you could make the case it's it's somewhat unbalanced or weighted toward the bottom but it's definitely balanced overall to left to right because if you even if you count the tree stump uh, this arm being projected there was sticking out there and the spear originally much longer would roughly balance to me anyway this area and this area. So left to right, it's mostly balanced, certainly his body is, but uh, maybe somewhat unbalanced from the bottom. Okay, we're kind of at an odd, uh, we're not at uh, you know, five minute intervals here. So I would say, any questions, first of all, any questions before we take a break? Let's take it. You wanna to keep to a 15 minute break? Is, is that agreeable? Anybody? <laughs> is that That's fun. So you said we just have two more slides when we get back. Oh no, no, four more. Oh, okay. more, but two of them are so important i'm not cutting them from the study list yeah but we are still end early i have a few and i mean a few of my own slides there's only about 10 not like 30 or 40 like we saw of uh, athens of the parthenon up close it's a beautiful structure and that's worth looking at but that's optional of course that'll be like the last 10 minutes we're still gonna end early though so if we want to call it 15 minute break then can we make it uh, 10 after 8 is that okay to everybody for us to resume that's actually 16 minutes. Okay. Nobody objects. <laughs> All right. I'm going to stop this year here. All right. We'll see you guys in about 16 minutes. Okay.
Okay. Well, and the muscles, of course, everywhere. <laughs> then it does show that it's recording when I hit it's that. Right. Thank now. you. Thank you, everyone, because, yeah, that wouldn't be good because you want to be able to review because at least one of the slides from this section, uh, the, the remaining uh, Greek slides, uh, it has a high probability of being on the midterm, and here it is. This slide is really important. I'd say the two most important ones for tonight that are, on. that, yeah, that are almost guaranteed one of the two at least to be on the midterm are the last one, the spear bearer, and this one, which is, you know, several of you, um, <clears throat> right? is the Parthenon, P-A-R-T-H-E-N-O-N. -E okay, now here we know the name of the architects and I'm sorry, yes, they are Greek and therefore multi-syllabic last names, usually, you know, four syllables each. Um, I'll spell them each, uh, you know, so slowly and then repeat them once. Callicrates or Crates, K-A-L-L-I, K R A T E S, K A L L I, K R A T E S, and Ictinos, I K T I N O S, I K T I N O S, 432 B C or B C E. This building set the um, standard. There we go. That's the right word for uh, the golden age of classical Greek architecture and it created a new technique for designing Greek classical temples that's still being used all over the world today. Not maybe by Frank Gehry, architects that don't like symmetry and balance, but there are people who still design buildings with this same concept. So there's a lot to say about this. So I'm gonna go ahead and tell you that I wanna give you Mostly, you know, the, the, the salient facts, but I don't want to skip over one or two things. So I'll do this. I will tell you all the information. I'll say it slowly. Then at the end, if you need me to repeat anything or summarize something, I guess I can before we move on to the next slide. So let's start with the fact that this was a temple dedicated to the goddess Athena, who was the protector goddess for Athens. This is where the name of the city came from, of course, was the goddess Athena. She was the goddess of wisdom, and some say of uh, female strength or, you know, stamina, but that's, you know, a secondary thing compared to all the other gods and goddesses. She's most famous. Usually there was one power, quality, strength, whatever you want to call it, that these uh, e ancient Greek gods each had that, uh, that stood out. That was their out outstanding characteristic. Okay. Hers was that she was the goddess of wisdom. Very interesting. They chose a female for that. Now, of course, as you might guess, and if you don't already know, you should write this, her statue was in the back of this temple when it was completed, and it was 50 feet tall. Remember, that was the uh, assumed height of all the, the major gods and goddesses. The Greeks believed their gods, the main ones, were 50 feet tall. So there was a 50-foot tall statue made out of gold and ivory, if you can believe that. Very valuable. Disappeared a long time ago, I think sometime after the fall of Rome. The Romans worshiped her too, by the way. You remember the Romans, if you didn't know this, when we get to the Roman slides in the next two weeks, actually, uh, we'll recap the fact that the Romans um, adopted the same basic concepts of, of their religion of, from the ancient Greeks and artistic styles. Then they added some new things too, of course, but they were very, very strongly influenced by Greek architecture and Greek uh, 
mythology or Greek religion. Because to them, that wasn't myths. That was their religion. Okay, so this is the temple dedicated to Athena. Her statue once stood at the back, 50 feet tall. But the main thing that the temple did, as I said a moment ago, was set the standard for classical Greek temple design. What are those features? We'll start with the fact that it had a portico isn't by itself a columned porch. Here's the definition of portico. It's on your, your list of terms to know. Very short in this case. <laughs> the next two definitions, there are only two more tonight, are both short. Uh, portico is a columned, you know, ED, right? Columned porch across the front of a Greek or Roman temple, period. This is a portico. Okay, I actually had a handout, which I will hold out, not a handout, not a handout, a drawing, I keep saying handout, uh, a drawing that I made uh, during the break between the two classes that I've taught tonight. And I'll show it to you at the end in case it's not 100% clear, but where my cursor is, that's the portico. So it's above the base, that's the base, the bottom. And in this case, the base doubles as a staircase, but a base could just be you know, a solid piece of stone with maybe steps in the middle. This, the entire base is a set of stairs, as is true of most Greek temples, but that's not a prerequisite. But a column porch, which is symmetrical to the human eye, but it isn't in reality. That's where the genius, the brilliance of this comes in. That's going to take a moment to explain, but for now, just write it this way, that a classical Greek temple in the styles that this building uh, you know, first combined it, each of these features, not styles, features that were all used in one temple for the first time are symmetrical or at least the appearance of a symmetrical facade. Everyone knows what the word facade means, right? The facade, the whole facade. Of course, it's in ruins now, but originally it was totally intact. And when it was intact, it was totally symmetrical, including the porch, the portico, it's called. Sorry, you got to use the right word if it's on the exam, portico. And the pediment, the pediment is of course missing the whole upper half or not maybe half, but a whole section. And a pediment, your last new definition, again, it's uh, mercifully short. A pediment is a triangular enclosure, right? Around the gable end of a Greek or Roman temple. It can be on a house too, but we're just focusing on Greek, uh, ancient classical Greek architecture. So I'll say it again, a pediment, uh, follow the, air, uh, the cursor here, is a triangular enclosure, obviously it went all the way up here and back down, around the gable end, of course everybody knows what gable is, right? Gable end of a Greek or Roman temple. All Greek and Roman temples had pediments above the portico and the temples rested on a base. So those are the three parts. And I did a nice drawing, and I'm sorry I got distracted about the, understandably, about the recording versus not recording, or I would have held that up. So I'll hold that up for you before uh, I show you uh, just like 10 of my own slides of this place, because I got some reading. You can't do what I did before. You can't get up close to this anymore. Unless somebody here been to Greece, anybody been to Athens, I mean, specifically, anybody? I know in some classes I have at least one or two. Well, if you go there now, you, you, you're not going to get much closer than about 30 feet away, maybe 20 feet away. There are ropes and there are, you know, guards. I guess too many tourists climbed up and, you know, wore, wore down the marble. It is marble, by the way. Okay, so what was in the pediment, though, is part of the meaning. A giant sculpture of Athena, not 50 feet. Of course, that's not anywhere near 50 feet. That was in the back, a separate statue of her. But there was a piece of sculpture here in the pediment of her and some of the other gods around her, you know, as they would be at Mount Olympus, supposedly, how they look when they were up on Mount Olympus. But the main figure in the pediment would have been a, a large image of her, so probably like 10 feet tall or so in this pediment. Okay, so the pediment group is missing. I'll come to why in a minute. I'll bet one or two of you know why. It's a case of theft. <laughs> but let's talk about the technique. This is a part of the meaning we're still talking about that marks this as a seminal work of art for the first time ever on any temple in the ancient world. And now it's copied all over the world. I'm not exact, not just in Europe and North America. I've seen them in Asia, Greek style buildings. Uh, in Hong Kong, in the harbor, there's one. 
not in the harbor, but on the harbor. It's the uh, British Cultural Society. I don't know if they closed it now under the Chinese communist crackdown on dissent and everything Western. But anyway, at least the last time I was there, you could walk into it. And it was a Greek temple style building in the harbor of Hong Kong, <laughs> just halfway around the world, right? So this, this style of architecture, Greek classical temple design is still being used uh, in uh, many, many, just say many parts of the world. Okay, so we already said that it's symmetrical, meaning it looks balanced left to right, and it has a pediment and a portico on top of the base. But what it isn't obvious is enstasis. Now, I used to give that as a definition that you had to write now separately, but you don't now. It's not going to come up on the uh, definition part of the midterm, but it relates to the meaning of this slide. Enstasis, uh, it has more than one meaning, but when it comes to temples, is a very specific meaning. End stasis. I wouldn't worry about the spelling, but I will spell it for you. Remember, any word that's not on syllabus, you don't get points off if you don't spell it right on the exam. But you might as well write it correctly in your notes. End stasis. E n s t a s i s. End stasis. Pretty much phonetic like it sounds. What does that mean? Well, let's get up closer. The columns, now that I will mention this, I'll bet it'll become obvious, are not evenly spaced, but they appear to be to the casual observer, or you could just say most observers, assume or feel or think, however you want to say perceive it. That's the right way to say it. I'm sorry, I'll say it again. Most observers, at least initially, you know, when they first see the temple, they perceive the columns to be exactly evenly spaced. Why, why wouldn't they be? Isn't that necessary to make it look symmetrical and balanced left to right? No, because human beings don't see things this big. This is a huge building. These columns are 50 feet tall. And the portico probably rises to 80 feet. So what you have is a building that has been deliberately designed to look symmetrical and don't ask me to do this. The only person that could do it was Ludwig van Duck or van Drake, right? The Walt Disney uncle of uh, Donald Duck did a thing on geometry in which they explain this, but I can't. So I'm just gonna say the columns are not evenly spaced. They are deliberately unevenly spaced. So they'll look evenly spaced. There's no other way to say it in a simple single sentence. You don't want me to, you know, and I wouldn't be good at giving you a more detailed description. It's a mathematical formula that these architects worked out. Genius. They figured out that if you don't do that, people think, why are the columns not evenly spaced? But when they stand here in front of it, certainly initially, there's no way you would guess that. There's a difference of maybe a foot or more in the space between these columns and these two. When I tell you that, you're probably starting to notice it, some of you anyway. Maybe, maybe it's not obvious even then. But it is a fact that the columns are not evenly spaced uh, you know, across the portico, but they look to be because of this new formula. And it was a, a mathematical formula, you know, an equation actually, uh, which was worked out by these architects and never had been used before. And it creates the illusion of perfect symmetry. Just keep it simple, that, that's brilliant. Now, the couple of other facts about the meaning, why is it in ruins? Oh, it's old. No, actually, it would be in almost intact condition. If here's part of the meaning now, and this fact I think is probably more of the more interesting. The ruins or the sections of the temple here that are, you know, the columns, for instance, that are knocked down. I mean, if you walk around it, you'll see the whole back half. The columns are almost all on the ground, right? Or very few of them are standing. So just say many of the columns in the entire roof are missing. Why? because of the Turks. The Turks didn't respect the countries that they invaded. There's just no other way to put it. I mean, you know, they probably shot the nose off the Sphinx. We talked about that. We don't know that, but there's some evidence for that. In any case, they definitely didn't respect the ancient Greek culture they were uh, you know, occupying. So about, just say, keep it simple in a sentence and say about 300 years ago, uh, Turkish soldiers who were occupying Greece stored gunpowder of all things in the temple. And it ignited one night. No one knows if it was an accident or some kind of battle. I don't know. But just say the gunpowder that was stored carelessly, you could say, uh, inside this temple uh, exploded one night and blew the entire roof off and many of the columns to the ground.
Otherwise, it would be almost intact. Except for one other fact, and here's the last fact about the meaning, and that is the pediment. I just said a, a few minutes ago, I'll tell you why there, there's no sculpt. Well, there's one little tiny section left, and even it's missing the heads, right, of these two figures. So what happened to all these statues of the gods here? They were stolen by a British general and nobleman named Lord Elgin, and he is a... a um, goat is that the word an evil figure you can say a criminal in the minds of every greek i've ever talked to and i don't blame them so just say he was one of the british generals who helped the greeks defeat the turks so they got their independence with the help of the brits they appreciate that of course but then he decided he liked these sculptures so he had them taken down and shipped to london and that's where they are now. They're in the British Museum. I think one or two of you said you've been to the British Museum. Is that right? Did I ask that? Well, if you've been there, you probably see them because they have a whole wing of the museum to themselves. And to add insult to injury, you don't have to write this. They're not even called the Parthenon Group, which is what they should be from the Parthenon. They're called the Elgin Marbles. Like he, he created them. He stole them. <laughs> the Greeks have never forgiven them. And they're still a lawsuit pending in, in um, world court, or I don't know what they call it, whatever body there is that, you know, judges these things. I don't know why the British government hasn't been pressured or forced to give them back to the Greek government, but they haven't. They're still in London 200 years later, uh, but they belong back up here. Now, of course, they'd have to finish restoring it, and they're working on restoring it, the Greek government, by the way, now. Okay, that's uh, plenty of facts, except for one last thing you could add. You don't have to, but if anyone has seen the movie The 300, or there was an earlier version called The 300 Spartans when I was a kid, that was all, you know, claymation, <laughs> and uh, special effects were limited then. But the newer version with really good special effects, a true story about the 300 uh, Spartans who protected Greece against the invading Persians. Well, this temple, unfortunately, was a victim of that invasion because all they could do was delay the invasion. Uh, and so some of the, the artwork and, and the valuables were saved from Athens and other cities, but the temple was just damaged by the Persians. And so this is a rebuilt temple, the one that we see now until, of course, the explosion when the Turks occupied it. So uh, the, the version of the Parthenon that is now on that hill, which is called the Acropolis, Acropolis, just like it sounds, A-C-R-O-P-O-L-I-S, which means fortified hill. Uh, it's a word that the Russians translated into the Kremlin. The Kremlin is exactly the Russian word for Acropolis. The Russians have a very strong connection to ancient Greece. They consider themselves the new Athens. Uh, talk to Russian historians, you know what I'm talking about. But don't write that, but do write the fact that it's on a fortified hill. And it was one of five temples. That's the last fact you, you should add about the meaning in your notes. It was one of five sacred buildings. They were all temples to different gods in ancient uh, Athens. And this was the most important one because it was symbolic of the city's patroness right? The protectoress, the goddess Athen, Athena, sorry. Obviously, they named the city after her. So the rubble here is from one of the earlier and uh, destroyed temples. And it was just left there for like 2,500 years. It's been lying around. And it's pretty amazing, isn't it? Because they're not going to put that back on this temple because they don't need to. But they're restoring it slowly, the Greek government. It, it'll probably take them another century to finish. Okay, formal analysis. It is very balanced, even though there is a different amount of space between each of these columns. You can still make the case that it's the same difference between these three or these uh, right three openings on each side. So it, and it, anyway, it appears, and that's what you write about is what you see if it's on the exam. Of course, is only what you can see in the slide that you have to describe. So just say it has a a, a balance or a apparent balance left to right and i would say top to bottom because the base is about the same goes down to about here because the rubble obscures the bottom step so just say the base is about the same mass as the pediment so which is the largest mass boy that's hard i don't know i if it had the roof you'd say the whole roof line if you counted that the foundation the technically say again go ahead the foundation yeah i actually i was about to say that yeah good point it, yeah it is because it, it's wider Yes, you, yeah, I would say you're right, yeah. 
uh, let's just keep it simple and direct and say, yeah, okay, then there's at least one largest mass and that's the base, yeah. Now between the columns and the pediment, what's left of the pediment, if you count the portico as one mass, then it's the second largest mass because there's a lot of empty space, but still these are 50 foot tall columns and they're quite wide, several feet wide. But if you don't count them as a, as a single mass, the whole portico together, then you'd say the pediment is the second largest after the base and then the columns in that order. The rhythm should be obvious uh, with the columns themselves. By the way, they're called fluted. You're going to show you some close-ups here where the, the, when the sun hits, this is a beautiful color. It's a warm yellow marble. Here it looks kind of slightly off what, uh, slightly tannish even, but it's actually a yellow marble. Uh, that's one phrase used to describe the type of marble used here. So it is an actual warm color. It's not your stark white or grayish off-white that some marble sculpture was in ancient Greece. So there's a warm color to it. The modeling is, of course, only shadows from the sun. Uh, and the space, well, the columns are nearly 50 feet. I think it's 48, say. So just say nearly 50 feet high. The ceiling inside was over 50. It had to be to get the statue of Athena inside. So it's, it's, it the ceiling is over 50 feet high. Uh, and the peak of the pediment was, well, I'd just say at least 70, over 70 feet, probably, you know, 72 or 75, something like that. Just say uh, somewhat over or uh, slightly over 70 foot high. A pediment where it would have been originally when it was intact. Uh, when you add the base, you know, and everything, I think it, it comes closer to 80. So say between 70 and 80 feet is the height of the entire structure from the ground up. And there was several rooms inside, which of course now there's only part of one wall section left. The statue was in a separate room at the very back with its own walls, you know, that's all gone. So there were several rooms inside. Um, and then we have a uh, stable. Oh yeah. The only thing dynamic would have been the pediment. And I guess you could say it's still what's left of it. It's still dynamic on the top part. Uh, but uh, the columns are round though. So you can make the case that they're both, uh, but, but the shape of the columns, the proportions are upright, of course, therefore stable as is clearly the foundation and would have been the ceiling when it was still there inside. Here, there's the real smooth texture of marble. The only cement texture is what minimal sculpture is left here. If we get up closer, you can see there's a couple of animals, but you can't really see it much. So you could say there once was simulated texture done with carved line, of course, which is mostly taken off or, or stolen, <laughs> missing, however you want to write that. So now the texture is mostly the real smooth texture of the marble. Here there is carved line, of course, you can still see as uh, on this, and that's uh, called a freeze. You don't, I used to put that word on the syllabus too. So I've tried to cut things down to make them simplar over the years. A freeze, F-R-I-E-Z-E. -E. You don't have to use that word in your notes. You have plenty of notes now, but if you're doing a formal analysis, you might want to use that word is the decorative band just below the pediment. Uh, that has carved line, but there, all the other lines that we can see in this photo are visual lines around the, you know, uh, underneath, right? These are two friezes, one plain and one decorated. So there's visual line created by the shadows. And of course that modeling is just from the sun itself. Uh, stable balance rhythm. I think we've got it modeling texture, everything, I believe. Okay, you can uh, rest your note taking hands for a minute and see some examples of what I was talking about earlier about how influential this style of architecture is in other parts of the world. This is in Nashville, Tennessee. It's an exact replica of what they think the original Parthenon looked like with, there she is, Athena. That's her with her helmet and armor, apparently leading uh, the other gods into a battle of some kind. And then here's what was in the uh, frieze. And we know the colors were something similar. We don't know exactly. Uh, and here's the, it, it completed intact pediment and here are your columns which are also unevenly placed but it'll look to be totally even spacing it's in nashville tennessee and i don't know what it is if it's a museum i i got this off the internet uh anybody here been to nashville <laughs> uh, oh well anyway it's yeah you know, music country music capital of the u.s but it was in the middle of the south it's what yeah of course they use this style of architecture for some of the southern plantations right 
uh, as well. So it was very influential in, in early American architecture, but this is 20th century. This was created probably in the 1920s or 30s. Here it is again across the lake. Now, this is not a must know, we'll get to the next must know in a minute, but this is one of the other five temples on the Acropolis, the fortified hill that uh, is where the um, Parthenon is. This is the Erechtheum, just like the word erect, T-H-E-U-M. It was their treasury. Uh, Athens kept their gold and other valuables in here, at least some of them, their valuables. And these are Amazon warriors, eight feet tall uh, statues used as columns. And the Amazons weren't that tall, but they were unusually tall. And yes, there was a real tribe called the Amazons. Today, we'd call them Ukrainians. It's part of Europe that's now Ukraine, which as you know, is now, I think you all know, is not as part of Russia anymore. People still say that. They're not Russian. They speak their own language. They don't want to be confused as Russian. There is what was part of the Soviet Union, south of Russia. That's where these people came from, these warriors. They were very fierce and they usually won almost every battle they were in, these female warriors. So the Greeks admired them, if not even feared them, and they used them as decorative features here, symbols of strength and stability as columns on the porch. And to this day, every art museum I have ever been to, not every art museum, sorry, in every city which has, you know, older art museums from before, say, 1920, there's these figures, they're called, you don't have to write this, a caryatids. It's an interesting phenomena, which would ind indicate that they had something to do with supporting the arts. And there is some evidence for that. Not only were they great fierce warriors, the Amazons are an amazing culture. I'd like to know more about them, but I'm so busy with you know all the other stuff that we all have to cover each semester. I haven't done any reading for a long time, but if someone wants to for extra credit, that would be worth five points. They also were great uh, artisans, or you know, at least some members of their of their culture created wonderfully beautiful and realistic looking small figures, figurines, and jewelry and decorative arts in metal, in precious stones. They were quite talented. So that would have kind of fit with this being the treasury for the city of Athens. It's called the Erechtheum. It's also where the ruins of a previous building was on the site that the Persians had destroyed. Okay, we are going to get to the next must know. Uh, and I'm gonna see the time here. Let's see, what have we got? I think we skipped one. Yeah, we did. No, we didn't. Yeah. All right. It's coming up. It's called the young warrior. Some of you saw it on the syllabus. It's just in a different order than this. Okay. We're going to look at the uh, temple of Athena Nike. That's the next must know. Temple. Then we have three more must knows, but they won't take as long as that last one. Temple of Athena, same goddess, right? Nike, N-I-K-E. Yes, that is the goddess minor Greek goddess named Nike, for which the tennis shoe company took its name, or from which. So Athena, just like she spelled right with an A, Athena Nike, the temple of Athena Nike, the architect, is one of the two that designed the Parthenon, Callicrates, K-A-L-L-I-K-R-A-T-E-S, 425 BC. So this is one of the other temples, one of the five, just say one of the five, including the Parthenon, on the Acropolis. It's on a hill above the main city streets. In fact, I'll show you here, this is a very old slide. So it doesn't really show it as well as that next one. If it's on the test, I use the other one. But it is good for showing the setting. Athens is a city of six, seven million easily by now. And it's one of the most polluted cities, at least in Europe, if not in the world. Uh, and this is a long time ago. This slide must be at least 50 years old or, well, maybe 40 or 50. <clears throat> so it's happened to be a clearer than usual day. But that's the, the, the location. Look how high it is, hundreds of feet above the city. So it's on that fortified hill called the Acropolis, one of five sacred buildings, all, all of them different kinds of temples. And this one is dedicated to Athena's sidekick. It was really the only way to say it. You could say assistant or companion. That would imply maybe a different kind of relationship. This was a minor goddess Athena Nike was a minor goddess who accompanied Athena on all her missions, all her travels, and was her messenger and assistant. That was her role. And she was human sized. And I'll show you an image of her. There she is. That's the sculpture that was on the back wall of this small temple. 
And look how lifelike and, and realistic it is. This is classical sculpture, of course. And she's adjusting her sandal because she's landing somewhere on earth to deliver a message from Athena. That's her job, one of her many tasks that she would carry out for Athena. It's missing the head, obviously. Otherwise, it's in pretty good shape for something this old. And you can see she has a perfect physique, again, according to Greek mythology or religion, that would mark her as what, favored by the gods? No, literally one of the gods, who all the gods, gods and goddesses always had perfect physiques in ancient Greek belief. There's another view of it. Okay, so let's go back to the building because the uh, meaning is one more feature about it. These columns are obviously nowhere near, well, it's not obvious. They're nowhere near as tall. These columns are only about uh, 12 feet tall. They're much small. The whole temple is a very small temple compared to, of course, she's a minor goddess. So it's not gonna you know, have to have the scale of the uh, Parthenon. And her sculpture was on the back wall. I just showed you in bas relief, right? We've covered what that is. That word will come up for sure somehow on the midterm. So it's a bas relief panel, a life size, supposedly, you know, adult human woman uh, back there would be like five and a half feet, maybe at most. And so there's a life size uh, figure, you know, the size of an adult female of her Athena Nike on the back wall, or there was, that is now in a museum. It's missing the pediment. Again, I don't know why. Uh, here, we know why the one at the Parthenon is missing, but this one, it just could be time over time, but it still has the portico and the base and all the walls are still here. So it's in, uh, in some ways better shape than the Parthenon. But these columns, last part about the meaning are the uh, one of the more, you, there's, uh, I don't wanna sidetrack you guys, but there were three styles of Greek columns. Some of you know this. I don't expect you to know them for the exam, but on this slide is part of the meaning to say that this, these columns are Doric, D-O-R-I-C. D-O-R-I-C. Doric is a type of column, style of Greek column, ancient Greek column that has these, some people said ears. I've heard people say those look like ears. Scrolls, like as if they were actual scrolls, you know, of parchment documents and things across the top for their capitals. I did tell you when we looked last week, remember at the uh, Royal Palace Complex in Knossos, the capitals or tops of the columns, the word is capital have different styles in different cultures. Well, the Greeks had three different styles of columns with each one distinct from the style of the, the top of the, of the column or capital. So this has that scroll work pattern. You don't necessarily have to know that for the exam, but that's part of the meaning that marks it as Doric with a capital D, Doric style. Okay, that's plenty on the meaning of this. Is it balanced? Totally symmetrical when it was originally intact and here, it's hard to say, but I would say the largest mass is the walls if you count them as a single mass or the base. It's, it's you know, almost hard to know until you, if you had weights in the calculation of all the sections. Uh, but the walls are pretty thick and they're intact almost. So I'd say it's the walls, then the base, and then the columns because the pediment's missing. Again, totally symmetrical left to right. In this case, they did not use in stasis. And a building this small, you don't need to. Your eye doesn't play tricks on you when a building is in this scale, you know, and that's not even a quarter of the size of the Parthenon. Uh, so there's no unequal measurement between the columns. They are equally spaced. And so they are truly symmetrical. And of course, they create rhythm, the columns. And here's your frieze, the bas-relief sculptures of various minor figures. I'm not sure who they are. <clears throat> but of course, the stairs also create rhythm. There's carved line, what you can see, what little bit of it is, is on the frieze. So that in this case, you would wanna use that word. It's F-R-I-E-Z-E. -E. And then these are fluting. I didn't say that with the other one, uh, the other slide of the Parthenon. The, the ridges, you could say ridges if you prefer, but the right word is fluting, not as into play at a flute, the musical instrument, but the decorative uh, carving on Greek columns, F-L-U-T-I-N-G. Again, don't worry about the spellings of any word that's not on the exam, but you want to at least get close if you were to write about this on the midterm. There's no technique for modeling. Again, it's just the shadows from the sun. Here, the space is, uh, it was one single room, a rectangular room with about a 12, well, actually the ceiling was about uh, 15 feet high. Uh, but the uh, facade, the, the portico, sorry, the portico was about 12 feet, the columns, and that was what makes the portico, 
were about 12 feet. The interior of the ceiling was closer to 15 feet. Uh, the color is a cool gray here. And here's, there's the marble is the real smooth marble is most of the texture. There would have been some cement texture, but you can hardly see it on this frieze of these uh, figures. Okay, I think we covered everything, balance left to right. And I would say when the pattern was complete, it was balanced top to bottom, but the way it is now, the base is it's unbalanced toward the bottom. Okay. Oh yeah, we're gonna see, uh, okay, we've got two more. This is not on the syllabus, but it's uh, Neptune that most historians think. They don't know if this guy was throwing a spear like in an athletic contest or battle, or it's one of the gods, the god of the sea, Neptune or as the Greeks call them, Poseidon, carrying a trident. But it's a magnificent example of Greek bronze sculpture. We haven't seen bronze sculpture. This is in one of the museums, not in Athens, actually. It's in Delphi. But here's the next must know. So we just have two more. Um, and this one is um, young warrior, just two words like it sounds, young warrior. Okay, and uh, this is in Riace is a city in Italy, R-I-A-C-E, Riace, Italy, 450 BC. It's a bronze sculpture in contrapposto. Yeah, this one is pretty obviously in contrapposto because here he was carrying the raised and was carrying almost certainly a shield into battle. So we know that this was a warrior. Uh, he even uh, would have perhaps had some other kind of weapon. I mean, not a weapon. Uh, a shield's not a weapon. I meant a weapon, sorry, uh, in his this hand. But it's hard to know. We can't tell for sure. He could have been holding some kind of a, a dagger or the hilt of a sword. You know, we don't know. So possibly there in the lower arm was maybe some kind of weapon. The raised arm was holding a shield. And he is standing with a weight on the back leg. The front leg's loose. It's clearly contrapposto. And you see the, the, the uh, S-curve of the spine here even more so, right? Uh, and then we also have the perfection of the body, right? Uh, in the physique of the body, which would indicate the gods favored this person. This warrior, in other words, perhaps would be victorious in battle because the gods wanted him to be. It's bronze. And they were masters, the Greeks, in both marble and bronze of all the ancient cultures, probably the greatest sculptors, period. But certainly in those two mediums, I, I don't know how many ancient cultures carved, some did in wood. Uh, you don't see much, if any, Greek sculpture in wood. But in bronze and marble, they were the masters. No question, they were the best of all the ancient cultures in uh, realistic human figures out of either bronze or marble. And one other thing, this was found off the coast of Italy. Why, why do we say Italy when it's a Greek figure? Because it was being shipped from Greece to Italy when the Greeks ruled Italy. Most people don't realize, we'll talk about this next week, that the Romans did not start out anything close to being an empire. They were a small little village and they were dominated by other cultures. So just say at a time when Greece ruled much of Italy, not all, but most of it actually, uh, they had an empire, right? And that would be when this sculpture was being shipped to a port in Italy and it sank. The ship, of course, sank and the sculpture was lost. Buried in the mud in that harbor. I don't know if the ship sank in a storm or it was, you know, in a battle. It doesn't matter. Just say the ship on which this piece was scored, why we still have it and why it's in such good condition and why it's in Italy and not Greece is because it was about to be unloaded. Someone was buying it, of course, collecting it from uh, a Greek colony in, in uh, Italy, but they never got it. it. It sank to the bottom of the harbor and it was preserved by the mud for over 2000 years. And when it was found, Michelangelo went here and looked at it and it helped inspire his figure of David. That's the last fact about the meaning. So it's not a, just another piece of Greek sculpture. It was one of the first found intact during the Renaissance. And if you take art 1.2 or two, uh, you know, whatever, one point, uh, yeah, that's right. 
uh, 2.2 or 1.2. We will cover in those classes, which I also teach, the Renaissance. And of course, that's the reviving of ancient classic art. So just keep it simple and say that the last fact about the meaning is that this piece was discovered intact after being buried for over 2000 years in the mud during the Renaissance. And it was seen by Michelangelo, who was a young student, art student, of course, at that time. And it helped inspire him to create the perfect physique of David, his most famous sculpture, of course, was that giant statue, marble, of course, in his case. Uh, he also worked with bronze too, Michelangelo. But he was inspired by the find. This is one of the first pieces found uh, during the Renaissance of ancient Greek, intact Greek sculpture. So it's a pretty important piece for that reason. It's in a museum in somewhere in Italy. I can't remember where. All right, formal analysis. Obviously, it's two views of the same guy. So you'd say he is balanced. He's standing, of course, you know, intact, full human figure, up left to right, top to bottom. It's dynamic on the S curve. And I would say at least the extended arm and the head, but stable on the legs mostly, mostly, yeah. Uh, and to some degree, um, I guess, the upper part of the torso here. So it's both. Carved line obviously would have been used on this piece to create the similar texture of the muscles, the hair, especially around the face. Look at this incredibly detailed face. Even the eyes have much more realistic. You see why this is a classical piece and not archaic. There's no frozen smile here. This is a, a real person modeled for this. And it shows their emotions and their lifelike qualities. Okay, and then we have, well, I always mentioned the rhythm, the two, two, right? I think I did the two legs, two feet, two hands. Uh, and then the largest mass, well, when it was intact, it would have been his body and then the shield and then maybe a sword if there was or a dagger. But now it's just him, so it's only one mass. For space, it's about six feet tall. And I don't really see any technique for space because the shield's missing. Uh, it would be then overlapping if his hand was on, on a shield. I guess you could say the head headband over, overlaps his head there. Okay, and then it's a uh, neutral black marble. Uh, I'm not marble, I misspoke. Black bronze, sorry, I meant. It's not really either warm or cool. Bronze can, of course, more often it is a bronze. I, it, most people think of it as a brownish golden color, and when it's that color, most bronze is. That would be warm, but this isn't. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's the original color. In any case, the way it looks now is a neutral black color. The modeling is just the shadows from the museum, of course. Um, and am I forgetting anything? Texture, yeah, simulated texture is the real smooth bronze and uh, the real simulated, I'm sorry, the realistic simulated textures are on the uh, face, especially the beard and the muscles and the hands and feet. Okay, we're gonna look at one more, but uh, you can rest your, there's another view of it here. This is, uh, you don't have to write this, Alexander the Great conquering the Persian empire. You might say it's revenge for all the times, three times the Persians invaded Greece and the uh, Greeks kicked them, you know, beat them back, however you want to say that, defeated them eventually, not before they lost a lot of, of their territory temporarily were, you know, pushed back and then they resisted. But when Alexander the Great, that's him right there, came along, he was, by this time, he called himself Greek. He spoke Greek. He believed in Greek religion, is, even though he was born outside of Greece. So you can call him Greek. In essence, he was. The Greeks conquered under Alexander the Great. This is unique, unique in the history of the human race. There is no other example of this. One man with an army of only 30,000 men. Even back then in the ancient world, that was a small army conquered three continents in 10 years. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, it's hard to say, you know, was he a military genius? Just very lucky. Did the gods favor him? Were his enemies just incompetent? Maybe all the above. All we know is he succeeded where no one before or since has done. Now, Genghis Khan and people like that from, you know, Attila the Hun, some of the Asian conquerors moving into Europe, they conquered bigger territories and more, more lands. But not three continents and not with only 30,000 men and not in under 10 years. It usually took them, you know, a, a couple of decades and then they'd win some battles and lose some. He never lost a battle until he died in battle in India. Look at a map or a globe sometime and see how far Greece is from India. 
<laughs> so almost halfway around the world. His armies actually conquered a big chunk of India. And when he died, they just withdrew from it. So they didn't become part of his empire. But when the main point is after he died, we have the Hellenistic period. So let's wrap it up with the last must know. There's a close up of uh, Darius, the Persian king, knowing he's about to lose everything. He eventually lost his head, his life, his crown, his uh, you know treasure and everything was taken over by the Greeks um, when they won uh, at least two battles against his army. Okay, this is the last must know, and it's a pretty important one. I'm not going to cut it from the study list. Uh, it is Athena Nike, winged victory. You could just say Nike, and uh, it's on the syllabus that way. I should have said Athena Nike because that's who she is. This is the minor goddess who was the company, or you know, the one who accompanied the uh, sidekick or assistant of Athena, but you can just keep it simple in your notes and it's what's on the syllabus. Of course, three words, Nike in parentheses, winged victory. That differentiates it from the slide of the temple we just saw. Winged or winged victory. That's not a minor fact. That's how we know this piece is influential throughout the rest of the world once it was found. We'll explain in a minute. We only know the location. Some historians are sure they know who sculpted it and they even use the name in some textbooks, but I'm going with what Stockstead has, which is just the location where it was found about 200 years ago. Samothrace, S-A-M-O-T-H-R-A-C-E, just pretty much phonetic. It's a Greek island, S-A-M-O-T-H-R-A-C-E. Okay, that's an island in the Aegean. Remember, that's the Eastern Mediterranean, a Greek island. And the date is 190 BC. And this is Hellenistic. And that isn't a term I also used to put that on. So I had like more terms under Greek art than any other topic that I used to put on the list of terms that students had to write the definition of. But I you know, don't want to overload you. So I'll just say the meaning on this you wouldn't want to write. What does that mean? It's the late phase of ancient Greek art uh, after Alexander the Great conquered his empire and until the Romans took it over for about 200 years, that period, when the Greeks were still a powerful empire, well, they were a huge empire, uh, and that's called Hellenistic, which means of Greek or from Greek. It's actually, the word is Greek, Hellenistic. Uh, Hellas is the uh, ancient name for Greece. So Hellenistic, like the name Helen, H-E-L-L-E-N-I-S-T-I-C. I, I held that up, that term, remember, at the beginning of today's lecture on the hand-printed summary of the three main periods. So this is the late phase of Greek, uh, uh, ancient Greek art, uh, in, in which Alexander the Great's empire dominated uh, the whole, really all of the Mediterranean and much of Asia for about 200 years. And it's marked stylistically, though, it's all part of the meaning now still, by two features. One is a much higher, a much greater detail. Look at this feathers. See, she had wings like most of these, uh, not all the gods and goddesses did, but many of them did. She did. So she could fly down to earth. And she's coming down, by the way, on the prow of a ship. And that is part of the original sculpture, we think. I mean, there's some debate on that. But we'll get to how it was found and why it's used all over the world now. I'll explain that in a few minutes, this image. Okay, so her wings are an example. Her robes even. Look how much detail there is on each crease in her, her robes. Uh, so the first of the two things that mark this stylistically as Hellenistic are uh, a um, highly detailed right, a style. The, the decorative details you can say, or carved details if you want to, because it's all that with carved line, are much more ornate or much, much more intricate uh, on a Hellenistic sculpture. They emphasize the, the uh, details much more in the carving of these sculptures than any style before that, any other Greek style. And then the other feature is an emotional component. Well, you can't tell that because she's missing her head. But if you could see her head and you knew what's going on, then the emotion would come out very strongly. The emotional component here is what the subtitle, that's why it's in the syllabus as parentheses winged victory. 
She is happily celebrating or helping human beings to celebrate a victory, a naval victory. And Athena was proud of her humans. Yes, she saw certain humans as hers. She would help them, just like all the gods had their favorites and their enemies. So she would have been, what's Athena Naki doing here? Carrying out the wishes of her, you could say master if you want, right, of Athena. And Athena told her, go down to earth and land on the prow of that ship after they just won this battle in my name and reward them. Of course, these gods all could create anything they wanted. So maybe it was gold, maybe it was a feast, maybe it was, you know, that they all got to marry whoever they wanted to, you know, whatever. They got some kind of reward. Usually it would be material, something like, you know, valuables, jewelry, gold, whatever, or, or, or you know, plenty of food and wine. They'd be rewarded by uh, Athena through the messenger. So that's why she's landing here on the prow of a boat. But the last part of the meaning is it was found buried about 200 years ago, a little over, but just in the early 1800s, around 200 years ago by um, uh, some French explorers, but it, they were probably Napoleonic soldiers. So under Napoleon, while Napoleon was running France, which is why it's now in the Louvre. It is on the grand staircase of the Louvre Museum, the largest, most famous museum in the world. No accident, because you could say they stole this again, because clearly the Greeks wouldn't have wanted to let it leave if they had a choice, but they didn't. Napoleon ruled almost all of Europe, right? Except Russia and England. He conquered even more than Hitler did. So he had the right, or the right, sorry, I don't mean the right, the power. He had the power and didn't have to ask for the right to have it removed and placed in the new Louvre Museum. The Louvre Museum was just being open to the public then. So that's where it is. It's been there over 200 years. On the grand staircase, you have to walk past it to get in. If you take the staircase, nobody does anymore because they all go through the glass pyramids. And some of you know this if you've been to Paris or you've ever seen movies film there, you know, that this isn't the new entrance anymore, but it was the only or main, just a main entrance to the Louvre. That's why it was placed here. It symbolizes victory at sea, and that's the very last fact about the meaning. Something like a dozen or more, just say at least a dozen countries around the world over the last two centuries have used this sculpture as a model for their naval insignia. There's not really any other words you can use for that, you know, like for their Navy, their Coast Guard or whatever, their Marines, any one of their fighting, you know, forces that goes to sea. This was used by the U.S. Navy for not anymore. It isn't, but it was in the 1800s. So it inspired, you can say, naval emblems, you can say, or symbols for various navies and other, you know, naval forces because not only navies that go to sea, the Marines do, right, the Coast Guard, of countries around the world, at least a dozen of them adopted it as an inspiration for their own naval, their country's naval uh, units. You can say units, that's an easy way to say it. So you see how influential this was. And then on top of it, you had to walk past it to get into the loop for, for decades. Now, most people don't, don't see it because it's not the main entrance anymore. Plenty of on the meaning. You only need to remember six of those facts. Uh, of course, we're going to spend plenty of time talking about the, the midterm and how to study. Uh, and uh, you'll, you'll know how to do that. And of course, it'll be an open book test, obviously. So you'll have that big advantage. All right, let's wrap up this part of the lecture. And then I'll just take, you know, about 10 minutes. That's all it should be to show you my own slides of uh, just of, of uh, Athens and uh, the areas around the Acropolis maybe a dozen slides. Okay, this is a balance. Well, it was originally, it looks oddly unbalanced here because of the unusual angle, but with her wings exactly evenly spread her, and her body, of course, uh, in the middle between them, it was balanced left to right. And uh, some people would say it was weighted toward the top because of her wings, but I think with the width of the spread of her legs and her robes billowing in there, I think it's balanced both ways, left to right and top to bottom. Well, the largest mass is her body. Then you could say the wings and then the base, which is the prow of a boat, but you could just say base, would be the third largest mass. Of course, here we have lots of carved line. It creates semi texture on her robes and on the feathers. It's so realistic. You ever fit, anybody ever felt the feathers of a bird? I did on a science uh, field trip with my daughter when she was in like second grade at the Lawrence Hall of Science. They let you touch certain bird feathers if you're gentle and careful, so uniquely, um, soft texture. Uh, 
captured brilliantly here by the artist. Typical, of course, again, of Hellenistic art that it's so detailed. The modeling is the shadows from the museum, of course. Uh, for space, it's about a six foot high sculpture. You could say she overlaps the prow of the boat, I guess. And her robes, of course, overlap her body. Uh, the color is a warm yellow stone. You can't tell that from here, uh, but it is an actual warm yellow marble. Um, and then let's see, what do we balance? Oh, the rhythm, of course, with the two wings, the feathers on the wings, the robe, the creases in the robe, the arms and legs. Um, let's see, balance, rhythm, dynamic. Yeah, there's nothing stable about it. Even the prow of the boat has diagonal lines. Okay, so what I'm going to do is stop share for a moment, well, more than a moment, and I'll show you this. This might be helpful for some of you. It's new. I haven't used this. I know this is really low tech, but it actually is the same thing I've used in, in previous classes and uh, previous uh, Zoom lectures of, uh, sorry, it looks tilted, doesn't it? <laughs> I was drawing it in a hurry, right? right before class started. The pediment is you know, where the arrow points is the triangular enclosure at the end of the roof line, the gable, they call that the end of a, a pointed roof is a gable. The portico we've already mentioned is a column porch across the front. And then you have the base usually used as the stairs to enter. That might help some of you if you're writing about, and the odds are fairly high that you'll be writing about one of the Greek uh, uh, slides that we saw. Well, the most likely is of course the Parthenon because it's the most important one. Okay, so I am now going to uh, go to, let's see, I have to get to the slides, just a few more. And if you have questions, now's a good time to ask. It will take me about 90 minutes, seconds <laughs> to get to the um, slides I'm gonna show you from just a few more of mine. Anybody have any questions about anything we covered tonight or your papers? Don't forget, uh, you have to turn them in uh, before midnight, if you want full credit, of course, uh, and not have 10, five, sorry, five points off. Here we go, Greece and Turkey, there we are. Okay, so let me do what I did last time, and that's get this down to, <laughs> yeah, these are the slides I wanted to show you, but first we got to get a full screen, there we go. And then I, oops, I always forget. I have to do the share again. <laughs> yeah. So let's get rid of the background. When we get to share screen, this should take care of it. Okay. Okay, can people see this? Yes. Yeah, this is the uh, side, of course, of the columns on the Parthenon. They are so massive that when you look at them, it should bring a, a, some kind of a sense of the scale, even in these photos, of this temple. It was the largest ancient Greek temple. Now, I didn't say that. You don't have to add that to your notes at this late date. You've had plenty of notes for tonight. But it was the largest ancient Greek temple, I believe, ever built, in at least in, under Greek times. The Romans built bigger temples, so, so at least uh, up until the Romans, this was probably one of the largest temples in the world. Uh, there was something bigger in Asia Minor, that's true, there was, so, so at least up until late Greek times. See what happened with the uh, explosion of the, you can tell that this whole back part of the building blown to, to smithereens by the Turkish carelessness, if you want to call it that, or callousness, I'd call it callousness, of storing their gunpowder in the most sacred building to, you know, the ancient Greek culture, and one of the most beautiful monuments in the world. It's on the World Heritage List, of course, of unique historic sites for obvious reasons. Um, hang on, let's get a little closer, and you can see, though, look how finely, they, I'm amazed. The, this is the original stairs. They've been sitting there for 25 centuries. This marble is remarkably well preserved. But here, in case you're wondering, the darker pieces are modern insertions because these columns have been re-erected. They were in rubble as well before the restoration, which began, I think, in the, uh, I don't know, in the 60s or so. It's going to take them decades to, if, they, if they ever do finish it, ever do. But this begins to get you a hint of the color. These slides have gotten slightly blue over the <laughs> five years, I think, since I uh, digitized 
this file. Uh, but they have a, a, a warm uh, yellow color when you actually stand in front of them. And here's how close you used to be able to get. You can't get anywhere near that close anymore. But it gives you some scale, right? Look, look how massive. These are something around 50 feet tall, maybe slightly more. And then there's the rust that had occurred. There's the Temple of Athena Nike. We were just showing you see where it is above the city below. Uh, and this is a Greek temple, uh, which isn't anywhere near Athens. It's, it's in the interior of Greece, uh, not far from Mycenae. And when this was built, the Greek theater was, of course, one of the main modes of entertainment in ancient Greece and in, in, of course, Rome, too. The Romans copied that aspect of Greek culture. But uh, it's pretty impressive. Now, this is a different temple. This is actually, I mean, sorry, I meant uh, amphitheater. I don't even have been to the Greek theater in Berkeley on the UC campus to see music. I know I saw Linda Ronstadt there and Paul McCartney <laughs> and a whole bunch of other uh, acts from a previous century. Anyway, the point is that this was a, a, a Greek uh, city state like Athens and Sparta. It's Delphi. So we'll end with this. Delphi is an amazing site where they believe there was a magical uh, prophet who could tell the future, a, a kind of minor god who had the power to tell humans the future if they paid enough money <laughs> to be able to ask a question. So I know I'll get in trouble, but it, it's a kind of scam. I mean, you know, they got the tourists to come and then they'd say, oh, well, you have to wait a week, but stay here and we can find accommodation for you and that'll cost you X more drachmas. That's what the ancient Greek coins were called. <laughs> I mean, it was a nice setup for this city. They made all their money off of people coming to talk to this, probably some priest with a megaphone and, you know, uh, fog and, you know, what do they call that? Dry ice, you know, that creates fake fog in movies and things. So, or smoke of some kind and incense, whatever, mirrors. <laughs> they managed to convince enough people to come all the time, constantly during at least the, when the weather was, it's up in the mountains, by the way. Yeah, somebody the rivaling uh, generals would bump into each other on their way to visit her. Say, go ahead. Say that again. I didn't hear. Rivaling generals would bump into each other on their way to go visit her. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, the Oracle <laughs> of Delphi. Well, it was part of the religious belief. So you can understand how, you know, they might have thought they could actually hear about the, you know, the, their future or the future of somebody, they, 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 their loved ones or family members. This is the Roman part of it. The Romans, of course, took over everything. It's up in the mountains, not far from Mount Olympus, which is a real place, of course. Whether the gods ever lived there in the ancient times, you could decide that. But they believe they did. Of course, there was a storm. You'll see it out just end with a few more slides. When the storm hit, I thought I was hearing the Greek gods arguing with each other. This, this is the Roman part of this. This was the chariot racing. This was their circus. Circus meant a oval track. It didn't mean what we think of today, where chariots would race each other. It was a much, much smaller one than the one you'll see my slides of Rome next week or the week after. They're pretty, pretty impressive because of the city itself. It's just an amazing place, right? Full of so many fantastically famous Roman sites like the Colosseum. I'll show you my own slides of that as well as the ones in the Silvers. But that's next week. So this was built by the Romans when they took over Delphi. And that's where the Oracle, supposedly, you could go to hear the Oracle give uh, against her, right? Uh, you know, prognosis or answers to the questions people had about their future. Okay, so we're ending up with this where the the storm came out of the mountains while we were there. I was there with uh, two Greek friends and my girlfriend and another married, just five of us in this tiny little car, this French car we were driving around all of Greece. And a storm hit just as we were, you know, deciding whether or not to spend the night in a nearby, you know, B&B &B or something. So we ended up having to stay because the roads weren't, weren't safe until after the storm passed. It only lasted about an hour and a half or so, but it was pretty sp uh, spooky because lightning was dancing off of the stones. Now, I don't have slides of that because I have to be a really careless to stand and when the lightning's hitting and there's no way to protect yourself. Ben Franklin's whole concept of how safe it would be if you have a weather vane, you know, he invented the weather vane. I think some of you know that. There was no choice here because there weren't any weather vanes. So I did not want to stand in the open and, and I wish I had a picture of the lightning bouncing off these stones, but it, it did that while I was hiding in the maintenance crew shed. They told me, get out of that 
you know, open space, come here, or you might not live, you know. So I hid along with them while the lightning bounced off these structures. This is an ancient Greek temple. A uh, yeah, round one, they actually, I used to think it was the Romans invented round temples, but actually the Greeks did. And here's where the lightning hit in this area here. Uh, and uh, I think I might have one more view of it. No, that's of the Greek islands, yeah. Okay, so we, I, I said I would try to end around 9.15, but I'm going to stick around to answer any questions you have. Remember, your papers are due before midnight. So if you haven't finished, uh, if you're doing some final, you know, adjusting or revisions, you need to get them done fairly, fairly soon and send them in before 1159. I would not wait quite that late uh, as a remember. Well, let's, let's uh, go ahead and just. My title page that I got on yes. the email, when I downloaded it, uh, it said that I couldn't, I didn't have permission to alter the file. So <laughs> I just took a uh, like a screenshot image of it and I typed out Levi. Excellent, creative. So, I know that is a problem that I've heard. It doesn't. It seen. doesn't look pretty, but it it, it works. Of, it works as long as there's some way to identify. The reason is your name needs to be at some point on the page where the either I or the readers will add up the points on the cover sheet. So that's how we calculate your grade. And then when I get back to you, I'll explain what parts of that you might have missed or not missed um you know anyway it sounds like you've solved the problem it sounds a very very creative uh, okay but uh, now is a good time for any other questions that you might have about papers or extra credit or the slides that we covered um because i just want to double go ahead. Uh, i just wanted to double check about the sources what was the number of sources that we needed yeah three of one of which needs to be originally printed and that would mean that, of course, you were not going to access it from a library. Well, you could. Some city libraries are not. The campus libraries are not open, but the city libraries in Petaluma, at least in Santa Rosa, are. I think in Windsor, I don't know, and somebody else said <laughs> Rohnert Park, but whatever. You don't have to go to the library. You can find something like this. I'll give you a good example. Encyclopedia Britannica is originally, each time they revise the, every few years, the editions of it. Uh, they originally are actually printed. They still actually print them, but then it'll say that it'll say originally printed, and you need to write that in your syllabus. I mean, in your sorry, your bibliography. Uh, you know, originally printed or from original book or printed source in parentheses on the bibliography entry where you cite that source, and then you give me the URL for their online version of that printed source. Is I have a question related to that because I already sent mine in, but my first source on my bibliography was from Smithsonian Magazine. So I think that's- That's excellent. It's, that's, I don't have to say printed, right? Because that's kind of self-explanatory. Yeah, I, I agree. You're right there. That okay. I'll double check if uh, I might grade your paper. I don't know. It depends on how, how many I get and when I want to, you know, how many right. papers. So if for some reason I don't end up grading this paper of yours, I certainly will grade at least one of each of your papers and at least one of your, all your tests. I'll double check, like I said, and in case the reader makes the error that they don't understand that that qualifies, I, I'd correct that and add those points. But I don't think that'll happen. I know it's pretty obvious, like you said. All right. It says it in your entry in the bibliography so yeah it should qualify no points off of that anybody else um because now's a good chance to double check thank you yeah i just wanted to remind you real quick to uh i sent an email at your aol address um just saying or requesting that you send me the cover sheet again because it didn't love for me um, yeah uh, you know paper. what i'm gonna do uh, while this on my laptop is downloading processing what are all those words it takes a while i'm going to go out to my yeah just because it's reasonable since you're asking now and, and the paper is due i won't wait till after it's 45 minutes to an hour from now when it's all processed i'll go out to my other computer and if you send it to me it'll be on my aol inbox and i will forward to you another copy of the cover sheet but thank you for reminding me you know that is something i don't want to you know have you wait for okay so within the next 20 minutes, let's say, or less, I'll do that. Sounds okay. good. Thank you. Have a great night. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. Um, we still have a few minutes if people want to. I, you know, 9.30 is the official end time of the class, but since we ended early, I don't have to sign off until the last person asks, asks their questions. If you have anybody else in the remaining. Have a good night. Have a good night.
Yeah, that's it. Okay, everybody's for now. All right, um, I will see all your papers, or at least I hope almost all of them before midnight. And then next week, we're starting Roman art, a very important topic. There'll be two weeks that we're going to spend on that. Okay, see you guys. Have a, have a good week. Okay, good night.